I think we're due for big demand there. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to call this, uh, sorry, a little bit late, uh, Finance and Corporate Services meeting to order. Uh, we have a three items before us. Uh, there are no consent items, so we're going to get right into it with uh, item number one, and then the staff will be making a presentation. Thank you very much. I'm uh, delighted to be here today on behalf of uh, staff and the corporate leadership team and with the support of the community to present to you a recommended strategic plan to guide the next, this coming term of council. Um, I just wanted to give you a brief overview of where we've come. We started in 2017 with a proposal for community engagement and a project plan that Council approved outlining the steps that would be undertaken. In early 2018, Enveronics completed a community survey that identified issues that the community was interested in for its strategic plan. Compass Kitchener uh, then took that information and undertook a series of community engagement activities over the summer of 2018. And in the end of August, they presented a report to Council on the community priorities. Um, since uh, that period of time, there's been a lot of staff work and work with the community on collaborating in terms of understanding what the strategic opportunities were for this term of council. The community, uh, the corporate leadership team pre presented some uh, draft goal areas for council to consider. Council gave us some direction. We went out to the community this past April and I'm here to report back on the results of that work. So the uh, previous engagement has been quite extensive. Over this period, uh, we've uh, uh, communicated with over 2,000 people. The Engage Kitchener survey, we've used a different platform and it allowed us to provide some more additional analytics. So I'm gonna present those to you. In April, we took out the um, draft strategic plan goals and a series of uh, five actions for each of the five goals. You can see in the graph that uh, after the uh, engagement piece, we sent out an email to all of the stakeholders in the, that subscribed to the city and we got a huge bump up in terms of take up for um, survey responses. That's the area in blue. And then with each subsequent um, reminder email that we sent out and additional engagement that we sent out, we got some smaller bumps, but still some significant bumps of engagement. The map uh, is quite interesting. Um, the bulk of the responses came from the wards in the downtown area, quite significantly more engagement on those wards than in the surrounding areas. The level of support was overwhelmingly positive for the themes, the goals, and the actions. Uh, ranging from vibrant economy, which had a 74% um, approval, um, to caring community, which had the highest at 88%. But all of the results were, were quite um, high, showing that the um, goals and the actions are validated from the community. Wanted to share with you a few of the comments that we received from the public. This is a great forward-thinking plan. We received lots of very positive comments on the overall direction of the strategic plan. So happy to see arts development is at the forefront. We are a tech hub, but a great community also pays attention to its arts and culture development. I'm very pleased with the leadership the city is displaying in terms of taking serious action for climate change. Perfect. I'll say that again, perfect. I'm very happy to see the city taking a much more focused approach to improving its customer service. These goals are what I'm most excited about. As a newcomer, it's one thing to be friends with your next door neighbor, but it's a completely different thing knowing that the entire community is embracing you. This is a great set of actions. I believe that affordable housing is one of the things most lacking in our region and should be a top priority. So we have before you um, uh, the outline of the contents for the strategic plan document. There will be a full, fulsome um, uh, graphic presentation upon council approval. There are opportunities for council to direct us to make some changes uh, um, either today or at the council meeting. 
We are going to be suggesting that the plan be started off with the vision and mission, which haven't changed from 2000. There's a message from the Mayor and Council. We've addressed the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And then the bulk of the plan is the goals, the five goals, and the five actions for each of those goals. So the theme areas are people-friendly transportation, environmental leadership, vibrant economy, caring community, and great customer service. And then we're recommending that the plan conclude with our commitment to accountability. In summary, um, in terms of the message from the mayor, we um, crafted this statement based on input that we received uh, from one-on-one -on -one meetings with councillors, and we had a, a sit-down meeting with the mayor as well. If there's other things that you would like to see represented in this, please let us know. What you wanted us to uh, make sure that we had at the forefront that Kitchener is a great place to live. It's known for its innovation, for embracing technology, and it has great support for the institutions and the business community. The other point that we heard both from the community and from this council that Kitchener values new residents, uh, residents that have come here from around the world and across Canada. And also, as elected representatives, your first priority was to listen to the community to understand what's important to people. And Council is prepared to act on the priorities through the five clear goals and the 25 clear actions. And it was your hope, and it's our hope, that in four years, Kitchener will be a safer, more caring, and more connect connected city as the goals and actions within the strategic plan are achieved. You wanted us to thank everyone who helped create the new strategic plan. This was one of the most collaborative um, initiatives that I have been involved in, in terms of the intersection of the work from the City Council, from the Community Advisory Committees, with Compass Kitchener, and with stakeholders and people across the community. Um, the other important point that you made to us in um, January and again in April and again in, in March and then again in April was that uh, we need to deliver this plan in partnership. This isn't something that the city can deliver on its own. And so we've included that in the message that partnerships are an integral component. So I wanted to spend a, a little bit of time in terms of the uh, actions for each of the uh, goals. So for the people-friendly transportation, we're really looking to transform how people move through the city by making transportation networks safe, comfortable, and connected. We want to develop a complete set of city streets, the guidelines for those, and that they'll be used um, to implement that starting in 2020 to apply to all roadway construction projects. We want to encourage and incentivize alternative modes of transportation and um, developing and, su and subsidizing a bike share program by 2021. And we're in the process of conducting a pilot right now. Um, this was something that was very popular with the community, was improving the connectivity and the year-round maintenance uh, for multi-use trails and pathways as priorities through the Cycling Trails Master Plan. Our initial target is providing an, a minimum of an additional three kilometers to the existing trails by 2021. We also want to develop a plan to create pedestrian first streets between Victoria Park and City Hall and between the Ion and Kitchener Market by 2022. We want to install a continuous and protected cycling network that connects adjacent neighbourhoods to the downtown by 2022. In terms of environmental leadership, we want to launch and implement the climate action plan, the corporate climate action plan, to achieve an absolute greenhouse gas emission reduction of at least 8% by 2026. This is one uh, action that we adjusted in response to community feedback. We had to uh, achieve greenhouse gas reduction of 8%, and many people in the community thought that we could be, do better than 8%, so we've set 8% as the, the minimum. Starting in 2019 to lever the Energy Efficiency Reserve Fund and other resources to reduce consumption and emissions of our facilities and in our operations. We received lots of public comments on how the city should be a leader in its own facility management and uh, then um, put that out towards the larger community that putting it out to the larger community would be in terms of developing a community climate action plan with partner organizations by 2020. 
The other area that received a lot of widespread support was implementing the sustainable urban forest strategy with a focus on establishing a tree canopy target by 2020 and eliminating the uh, backlog by 2022. Reduce waste diverted to landfills by implementing a new diversion program at our facilities and events by 2021 was also very well received by the public. In terms of vibrant economy, uh, one of the things that I wanted to point out, um, in terms of its overall acceptance, it was high, um, but we had a, a, about a 13% um, of the responses were more cautious about implementing these, and they wanted to see these things in place that we're going to go over now before they would um, be fully supportive. So there's a, there was a bit of skepticism about um, being able to achieve these goals. So it's incumbent upon us to deliver on them and establish that credibility with the community. Uh, the first item is c to complete a new urban design manual by 2019 that expresses city building and design expectations to ensure the vibrant new development throughout Kitchener. Uh, foster the creation of citywide network um, through the build out of 44 Gockel Street and advancing the work on the creative hub. This was an area that council asked us to make some changes to the action and we have done that. Uh, develop the Make It Kitchener 2.0 strategy by the year 2020 with a focus on transformative actions. And this was something that council and the business community and residents asked for. They're looking for transformative actions. And you recently had a presentation from the economic development staff on how that um, could start to take place. Um, we had complete a comprehensive review of city-owned properties. We had um, the word inventory and the public, uh, very many um, of the comments were, don't just inventory, uh, tell us what these properties could be used for. Develop a vision for downtown Kitchener and continue to position Kitchener as a leading destination for redevelopment opportunities. Uh, with at least one new parcel of land brought to market by 2020 and finalized master plans for the Bram Yards by 2021 and the Civic District by 2022. And there's work in economic development um, beginning the initiation of that work. The next area was care and community, and this is an area that was new for the City of Kitchener. The other three areas were in the previous strategic plan, and this is in response to the great amount of public um, support for um, enhancing people's sense of belonging, connection by providing welcoming community spaces, better engaging, serving and supporting our diverse population and helping to make housing affordable. And this is the goal statement that Council um, provided a lot of direction on how it should be modified and this is, uh, it reflects what Council has directed. Uh, We've uh, seen uh, the widespread support, excuse me, support for creating a comprehensive equity, diversity and inclusion strategy and the public has been invited to um, put forward their names to assist on that. Um, the target is by 2020 to combat systemic barriers to full economic and social participation in the city. And there's not very many cities that have this. This would be something that's quite innovative in uh, the city of Kitchener and across Ontario municipalities. And certainly we heard the support for more cultural uh, diversity, respect for cultural diversity in the city, in the, in the comments from the community. We also heard a lot of support for creating an affordable housing strategy for Kitchener by 2020 in collaboration with the Region of Waterloo, community groups and the development industry. And this was one where it was interesting, this came up very strongly in the caring community category, but it also came up very strongly in the vibrant economy. So people were making the link about our economy is vibrant, um, and we need to address affordable housing to um, reinforce that um, vibrancy as well. Uh, we heard very clearly there's a lot of support if you have a chance to read through the comments that are appended to the report you'll see the number of comments about the need to reduce the stigma experienced by those living with mental illness and addiction in our community by educating and training staff and by supporting the creation of appropriate safe consumption and treatment facilities in Kitchener. Um, the other area where um, there has been a change from what you have seen is in terms of better utilizing existing facilities, providing relevant programming, support the equitable distribution of leisure programs and resources across neighborhoods. And the area that was changed, we had a list of five or, so, or six 
community centers and uh, facilities that we propose be included in this term of council. And with the changes that are proposed under the development charges legislation by the provincial government, um, we are um, more confident that we can um, achieve the Huron Brigadoon Community Center and not the other ones. And that's something that we'll be reporting back um, uh, as part of the development charges report. Um, we will also be uh, completing an open space, open space strategy by 2021. Um, this was the last action under care and community in terms of engaging a broad cross section of the community, including the arts and creative industry and the multicultural communities to develop a new and inclusive arts and culture plan by 2022. One was also uh, referenced by people responding to the vibrant economy and to the caring community. The last goal area um, is create um, great customer service with the view to increase people's satisfaction, trust and engagement with the city by providing friendly, easy and convenient services. This was one where um, people did not make very many suggestions for changes. They liked the uh, wording as it was here. Staff provided some wording changes, which I'll go over with you to uh, increase the clarity. So introduce a corporate-wide customer satisfaction program that will allow for collection of real-time feedback from customers accessing city facilities, programs and services by 2020. Provide on-demand support for customer service requests in many languages by 2020. We had that restricted to the customer contact center initially and in response to some feedback from the community and from staff, we've uh, broadened that. Enhance the online experience for customers by delivering, um, excuse me, uh, providing easy access to services and allowing them to conduct financial transactions by 2021. And people commented how much they would appreciate to doing more of their business with the city online. Implement a comprehensive program of customer experience reviews to help ensure services are easy and convenient um, to access from the customer's perspective by 2021. Set specific and clearly communicated service levels for frequently asked about or access city services, including tree maintenance, parking, property standards, complaints, snow clearing, and grass cutting by 2022. These are the areas where we get the most, access, uh, most requests for information. This uh, graph shows the uh, work that would be completed upon approval over the next four years. Um, in 2019, 2020, 2021, and 2022. Staff have spent some time uh, sorting out to make sure that across the corporation, staff are aligned to deliver these objectives in the time frame that's um, recommended. Another area of innovation in the City of Kitchener's strategic plan is its accountability commitment. So uh, we have done a lot of work that the plan contains specific measurable actions and a timeline for completion. I was just at a meeting of strategic planners uh, from across Ontario on Friday and everyone was very interested in terms of how the City of Kitchener is going to be accomplishing this. This is an area that a lot of municipalities struggle with. So we've made a commitment that our long-term financial plan, our budget and our annual business plan will be in line to implement the strategic plan. And I just met with the city of uh, Cambridge again on Friday to provide them with some direction on what we've been doing to achieve that. They would like to achieve something similar. We're very lucky um, and fortunate in having Compass Kitchener, which is an independent citizen advisory community, uh, committee, and they have the responsibility to assess our progress and report on how we're doing. And we have been working with them and we'll continue to work with them over the summer to come up with the measurements that we're all on the same page about what success will look like. Again, staff recognize, um, as council indicated, partnerships will be key to our success and we're going to have to make effective use of technology and innovation to have success in all of the five themes and in delivering each of the 25 actions. And what is uh, unique as well, uh, the city's corporate leadership team has personally committed to be accountable for the strategic plan and to regularly report on its progress. So we have our vision and we have our mission. 
tonight, uh, today before you, you have the goals and the actions. The goal is what we want to focus on and the actions are what we want to achieve. So we're poised at the point where we are seeking council approval. Over the summer, as I mentioned, uh, we'll be working with Compass Kitchener to look at the success indicators. In the meantime, we're beginning to start work with coordination on our business plan, which will indicate who will do what and when, and we'll tie that into our budget step. So you have a very um, ambitious strategic plan in front of you, but staff have committed to make it achievable. It reflects the priorities of the community, and it provides a focus for staff. It levers strategic partnerships across the city to implement the actions, and we will be um, uh, seeing change over four years, you'll see a, a, a difference in the city of Kitchener as a result of doing the strategic plan. That concludes my presentation. Thank you, Ms. Cooper, for your presentation. Uh, I have the three people in the queue written down, but we do have two delegations for this item as well, so we'll be doing, pardon me, we'll be hearing from the delegations before we get into questions of staff, okay? Uh, the first delegation, as is, as is appropriate, is the Vice Chair of Compass Kitchener, uh, Eurasia Lee. Good afternoon. afternoon. Uh, my name is Eurasia. I'm here to represent uh, Compass Kitchener Committee as the Vice Chair and also um, communities across the city. Uh, first, I'd like to express um, our gratitude um, for and support in the strate new strategic plan and its goals and actions, which addresses the community's priorities, which were conveyed to Council last August, and to thank you for asking what is important to the communities and what is needed to foster a path towards a more uh, caring, vibrant, and innovative Kitchener. Um, so, uh, Compass Kitchener presented to Council community priorities, which focused mainly on the environment, the economy, uh, social concerns, and organizational excellence. Um, Kitchener Compass, uh, Compass Kitchener, sorry, and Kitchener's advisory, advisory committees suggested draft actions for new strategic plan that focuses on community priorities, which include urban forestry and projects, arts and, cult arts and cultural strategies, climate action plan, environmental projects, creative hub projects, traffic safety, cycling master plan, and affordable housing strategies. Compass Kitchener is also um, dedicated to working with staff to provide a method and means to appropriately and accurately evaluate um, the way in which these strategic actions actually impact Kitchener's community um, and uh, the way in which um, the community travels across the city and, and lives. So recommendations presented to Council included actions that tackle core issues surrounding four main priorities. These include the environment, society and social issues, the economy, and the city providing excellent and efficient city services to its residents. The rise in social, environmental, and economic concerns and interests had to be heard and addressed. These areas included transportation, arts and culture, safe communities, enjoyable outdoor spaces, encouraging and building all sectors, and ensuring core services and supports are available to those who require it. And the city, and the city listened. Um, city staff and council took those concerns very seriously and found ways to tackle difficult social issues like mental health, homelessness, and the opioid crisis. The strategic plan addresses these core concerns like housing and security via the affordable action plan or affordable housing action plan, sorry, and homelessness and addiction were also identified concerns which the safe consumption and treatment facilities really focus on addressing and improving. So careful listening really paid off and there was widespread support, support from, the, from all sectors uh, towards these goals and actions. It's valuable to be able to see the community's responses in order to understand how greatly this does affect their, their life and living situations in the community and how they also participate in the community. Um, it was encouraging and refreshing to see these recommendations towards changes being implemented and truly illustrates how the city and council are invested in addressing these core concerns. So before I conclude, I would like to thank the advisory committees for all of their valuable input and to acknowledge the importance of collaboration between all advisory committees, Compass Kitchener, city staff, and council. Council's adoption of the strategic plan and all of its actions are the catalyst that will spur forward another four years of supporting innovation, encouraging a more caring community, and allowing the city to discover its many hidden gems by embracing the arts and culture and, and contributing to a more vibrant Kitchener. Thank you for your time.
Thank you, Ms. Lee, for your presentation. There are two people with questions for you. If you just hang on for one second, uh, beginning with Mayor Rabinovich. Thank you. Thank you, and thanks for uh, for coming in and for all the work that uh, that Compass Kitchener has has done. One of the things that I I often say when I talk to colleagues uh, around um, the countries, I talk about Compass Kitchener because it is so unique, quite frankly, and and one of the things that I think actually strengthens our uh, our strategic planning process. Two uh, two quick questions. One, um, you you focused in on the fact that. Um, our new strategic plan starts getting into some social issues, um, which is you know not necessarily the direct responsibility of, of the, the lower tier in a two tier structure, but but something that the community is looking for us to do and something that this council wants to do. Um, I guess my my question is, uh, you know, did, did you get a sense in any of the things that you've seen or heard, sort of what's driving that from a community perspective? Um, you know, some, uh, I was speaking with a, a major community partner just last week, and, and they were actually noting this, that sort of City of Kitchener's standing out in, in the region amongst the lower tiers of sort of going into this area. And, and I'm just sort of trying to get a sense of, you know, do we, get, do, do we know what's, what's driving this amongst our, our population versus sort of the other six communities in the region? Whoever wants to answer it. <laughs> Oh, sorry, Ms. Cooper, can you uh, just hit your request to speak button there and I'll cue you in. There we go. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, I, I didn't press it hard enough. Sorry. <laughs> um, one of the things that was really interesting was that it came in the Environic <coughs> Survey first, and it was an unbidden question. People were asked, what are the top priorities that the city should be addressing? And the number two priority was um, affordable housing and social issues and the opioid uh, crisis. So that was just bubbling up in, in the community. Um, you saw the report um, last week that housing prices have increased by 50%. That's uh, addressing a much bigger part of the society. Um, people are seeing more visible homelessness in the community, and the difference is there has been some education by the region and by the health authority um, around we need to reduce the stigma associated with that. So it was a convergence of a bunch of different factors. I was really impressed with the downtown um, community and the Economic Advisory Committee that they really saw that there was a role in new development coming to the city, that it shouldn't make things worse in the city of Kitchener, it should make things better in the city of Kitchener, especially with regard to affordable housing. And on the Compass Kitchener um, committee membership, it's very diverse. So we have people with strong backgrounds in business, we have strong backgrounds in social, and strong backgrounds in the environment, and strong backgrounds in the um, uh, recreation and culture. So it's a very interesting committee that has a good um, session, a, a cross-section of the community, and when it went out and uh, asked the questions of the community, again it came back. And when you read the comments that are in the back of this report, you'll see how widespread the city um, residents are in having council come up with what can the city do to achieve this. They understand it is a federal responsibility and a provincial responsibility, but they are looking for the city to do what it can do. Okay, thank you. And then I guess the last quick question to you as a member of the committee, on behalf of the committee, is there anything that we as council can do to better help you do your work? I think so, on behalf of the committee, we all think that um, the changes and the input that has been provided has been excellent. It's really refreshing when the city says, what, do, what does the, the community need to thrive? And we're going to look for ways where we can assist in that. And so um, the committee, Compass Kitchener, really agrees that the city staff and council have really taken big steps forward in becoming more involved in what this what the community requires in order for the city to thrive and start the grassroots so um you've provided excellent excellent help so far and input and really listen to us which is really what what we what's the essential goal is just being heard and having those implemented and so that's that's been done and that's really encouraging thank you great thank you and uh, mr chair at the appropriate time i have questions with staff and then we'll would like to move the motion very good uh councillor michelle 
Thank you. This is a really very comprehensive, in-depth report. You put a lot of work into this, and I really appreciate it. And I'll review it over again because it, there's so much information. But I, one thing stood out, and it's kind of piggybacking on what uh, Mayor Verbanovic was touching on. With regards to social issues in this report, um, you talk about training and educating staff on mental health and addiction issues. How is this, is this for a staff um, question, I'm not sure, but how, like how in depth do you plan on, where do you, where do you see that going when you say training staff? Like um, is this? Um, uh, Deputy um, CAO Michael May might want to add to this, but we have a lot of frontline staff who are dealing with people in some dire circumstances and they would benefit from training. It was the, uh, one of the top issues that came out in our staff um, consultation as well, that they need training to be able to more sensitively deal with people um, and provide services. So to complement the services that are already available to yes. everyone, not, okay, good, thanks. Okay, there are no further questions, Mr. I just wanted to add that, uh, you know, Compass Kitchener is the sounding board for this council. We hold the opinion, your opinion in high regard, and the fact that you uh, collectively think that we're on the right track with this provides us a lot of assurance, so thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, next delegate is uh, Mr. Sam Nabby. Good afternoon. Hi there. Um, there it is. So my name is Sam Nabby. I'm really thrilled to be here today and I'm really thrilled to see some of the uh, great stuff coming out in the proposed strategic plan that, that really aligns with what I'm talking to you about today. Um, in March, I uh, had an idea, and that idea turned into a couple community meetings, and those couple community meetings have turned into this presentation here today. So I'm here to talk to you about the Gockel Greenway concept, which would be uh, an urban park and multi-use trail connecting Victoria Park with City Hall. And there's a lot of, of uh, similarities between what's going to be in here and, and what we've seen in uh, the strategic plan. I do want to show how this idea will support City of Kitchener's existing policies, of course the strategic plan, people-friendly transportation, um, talking about linking Victoria Park with City Hall, uh, vibrant economy, talking about future redevelopment plans for the property at 44 Gockle Street, um, the Gawkle Street build-out being planned for 2019, that's very ambitious and welcome. Uh, and the fact that this strategic plan is talking about budget commitments um, to back up these, these uh, policies. The City of Kitchener also has a pedestrian charter. We want to create more walkable communities. There's uh, the parts plan that was created to manage growth around rapid transit stations. And it talks about Gawkle Street as a ceremonial link between the park and City Hall. Uh, and also talks about supporting active transportation um, by improving access for walking routes to the stations. We also have a commitment to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and our climate change targets of reducing by 80% by 2050. Uh, and downtown Kitchener's King Street streetscape revitalization, which was done a few years ago, um, would also benefit from having that atmosphere extended for festivals and events and bringing that pedestrian-first theme into other streets like Gockle. And lastly, there's the draft urban design manual, also planned for 2019, with a focus on pedestrian priority for Gockle Street. So all of this leads us to uh, a vision for what we can do with this three blocks of roadway um, that is currently, uh, actually currently it's blocked off, currently it's, it's being used uh, for construction staging for the condo that's being built at Charles and Gockle. Um, there's a lot of of uh, ambition that we can do here. We can turn this into a pedestrian area. We could turn this into a park, a civic square, a place for festivals. It could have citywide appeal and uh, it would be great for residents from all over the city to appreciate the Gockel Greenway when we have large events like the Blues Fest to have uh, two separate festival areas now connected, City Hall and the park. It could be used for Chris Kindle Market the Impact Theatre Festival. Um, currently in many festivals this road may be blocked off but it's only used for bicycle lockup and maintenance and um, there's a, we think that it, it could really be used in a better way. Uh, there's been other 
proposals thrown around a, as a walk of fame. Maybe we can have statues here. Maybe there can be public art. Maybe there can be a dog park, a performance stage. The possibilities are limitless. Um, the current traffic considerations on Gockel Street are interesting to talk about because right now it is blocked off. The current road, road closer has not significantly affected traffic in downtown and the existing travel um, along King Street, Halls Lane, Charles and Joseph, we would expect a pedestrianized Gockel to still allow those cross streets uh, to allow traffic uh, uh, to continue. Um, but we do want to prevent turning movements onto Gockel Street and to have a full separation of motor vehicles and pedestrians. So why am I coming to talk to you about this now? Is because the timing is crucial um, to, make, uh, to make this really happen in a smooth and, and coordinated way. The Charlie West condo construction is currently ongoing. They're planned to have construction equipment out into the road until about November. Um, if the city were to keep that road closed after November, and work on a pilot program similar to what we've done in Gowdy's Lane, animate it for festivals like Chris Kindle, and transition that into a long-term plan uh, led by staff that would see the entire road reconstructed for permanent pedestrian use. Um, that would be amazing. And I'd rather have that done starting now than open the road up again, close it again, etc. cetera. Um, a group of citizens, uh, we've. Uh, applied for funding to do a pop-up park event in September and uh, we have secured commitment from the BIA and we are waiting on funding for uh, the Love My Hood placemaking grant in order to uh, do this as a sort of fun event, as a visioning exercise for the community so they can see what's possible on this stretch of road and to feed into the staff work that will be needed to be done uh, to transform this, this uh, roadway. We want to build on the success of Gowdy's Lane. Uh, we think that there's a lot that can be done with paint, planters, picnic tables, and programming. Um, you've heard of P3 initiatives. This is a P4 initiative. Light, quick, and cheap. We can do a lot with that. Uh, there's been lots of discussion to date. I won't go through all of it, uh, but we've had a couple community meetings. Uh, business, the business community is involved, residents are involved, Downtown Kitchener Neighborhood Association, Victoria Park Neighborhood Association, Momentum Developments, uh, North Incorporated, Accelerator Center, 44 Gockle. These are all the businesses and organizations along Gockle Street. Um, the soon to be opened AOK Arcade Bar. Um, Brian Doucette, a professor at the University of Waterloo, has endorsed the plan and as well as a number of uh, interested citizens, some of who are behind me here. Some photos for your inspiration. And I'll leave off with this request. So we would like to request council do four things. Uh, one, ensure that Gockle Street remains closed to motor vehicles, keep the road closure as it is. Number two, have staff form an ad hoc committee to work with residents and businesses to, to get this underway and deal with the technicalities. Part of that is point three, working to figure out property uh, parking access. And finally, to make Gockle Greenway a year-round public space, even before we've physically redeveloped it, to treat it much like uh, the square outside City Hall, where it can be used as programmed space for the community. I've gone over time, but I'd be happy to take any of your questions. Thank you, Mr. Nabby. Really appreciate your presentation. Before I get to the queue, I just had wanted to, <clears throat> pardon me, check with um, uh, perhaps staff or perhaps Mayor Benovich. I'm not sure. Now, this is certainly uh, something that we could in, be incorporating in our strategic plan, but we have no information around it. And I know many, um, Mr. Nabby and I spoke, I'm certainly uh, supportive of pursuing the idea, and I'm sure memory, many members of committee are. Having said that, we could very well spend the next two hours talking about this initiative without having the information surrounding it. So I just wanted to connect with uh, either staff or Mayor Verbanovich in terms of what the next steps are so we can narrow this, this, this discussion. Mayor Verbanovich, did you want to? Thanks. So the, the intent would be, I mean, I, I intend to, as indicated, move the strat plan. This is one of the pieces in the strat plan. So the strat plan already speaks to the broader notion of looking at this in terms of other streets. Um, I know then that Councillor Chapman is going to be moving um, an, an amendment or a separate motion from the strat plan specific to the, this group's request about this street. 
Uh, I mean, it matches up with the, the work that the strat plan already speaks to, um, but, but obviously because of the time sensitivity around this one, um, moves it, gives direction to start looking at things to move it forward. Okay, very good. Um, perhaps then, uh, Mr. Navi, there are, are going to be questions of you, but Councillor Chapman, would you want to bring forward your, I know I haven't had a mover yet, but uh, actually Mayor Bamber is going to move it, but you want to bring forward your um, amendment now, so perhaps we can ask the questions and get out of the way at once here. Appreciate that. Oh, it's actually the specific one that was on your slide. Okay, perfect. That makes it simple. Uh, okay, uh, Mayor Verbanich, you had questions as well or comment? Well, just, uh, okay, go ahead. Just, um, I, I guess, a, a brief uh, comment and just maybe more just thanks to, to Sam and the group for um, inviting uh, Councillor Chapman and myself to their, uh, their initial meeting. I mean, the, the amount of enthusiasm amongst a cross-section of community members around this idea from people both in the sort of downtown and beyond has been uh, has been interesting um, there's obviously some some logistical challenges particularly as noted in in number three on that first block although that second block I mean we'll have ultimately free reign in the future because that second block is, is both sides are ultimately going to be redeveloped by the region and ourselves. Um, but the first block will have some work to do to, to just make it work with those four properties in particular. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Michaud. I just want to say I love this idea. I loved it the first time I heard about it, and I'm so glad it's come this far. Um, you know, with the with the new development, uh, we've got the Mets down on Cortland, the student old Schneider's place, Midtown, the East End development. This is the exact right time to uh, explore a walkable gockle, I'll call it. I just think it's a wonderful idea and great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Chapman. Yeah, I just wanted to thank you um, for all the work that you've put into it, Sam and, and team. Um, I think you've done a great job of tying it into also the strategic plan and the parts plan and, and other documents that, that we work with on a regular basis. Um, <clears throat> so I, I, this is a motion I'd like to table. The only modifications we've, I've made, we've made is a char to add Charlie West and Hartwood Place. Um, to the list of property owners. I, I hope that's okay with, with, with you. Um, yep, yep. And that makes a lot of sense. Certainly. Yeah. So um, this is the, the motion that Okay, we very good. Take. Okay, there are no further questions from Nabi. We really appreciate you uh, championing the idea and, and your support. Okay, so we're going to just discuss it briefly and uh, I'm, I look forward to seeing the work on this. Uh, Mr. Reedman, I have you in the queue and I just have one question, although I think it's I've made it very clear that I'm supportive of this. Uh, I only have some concern with um, item number one. Uh, obviously that's integral to the long-term part of this, but I'm worried about us passing the motion at this time, not giving property owners nearby due diligence in terms of voicing any concerns that they may have. So if you wanted to comment, I would appreciate it. Uh, through the chair, uh, so staff had not seen uh, this motion uh, before just now. Um, but uh, staff do have concerns with the first one because it does assume that it's a permanent closure. So I think part of the um, presentation and what staff's understanding was was to sort of pilot some of this work and see how it works with, and then come back with a, a recommendation for permanent closure if it's successful. And then number four as well assumes that this is permanently closed. Um, so there are some challenges around that and um, there will be budget implications around that beyond um, you know, doing a pilot work with paint, a, sort of a low-tech version, which is what uh, the delegate's presentation was talking about today. Okay, Councillor Chapman, would you like to respond? No, Mr. Chapman does. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I saw Chapman, Bob, I apologize. Mr. Chapman. And I just want to be clear, we're very excited by the initiative within the community and in particular Sam's leadership, um, you know, to, to mobilize community interest in this. It's totally aligned with the, the direction that the strategic plan is going. Our only concern is that one in four right now, basically without any staff report or discussion, would, would set a direction to close the laneway. 
uh, and this is very well where it may go. I think what's more helpful is to adopt uh, items two and three as the direction to staff today, all with a view to achieving one and four. But I don't see how council is in any position today to actually decide on one and four. I think it's clear that that's you know your long-term interest, and so let's start with two and three, uh, and then we'll report back on the feasibility of one and four. Thank you. That was exactly my concern, but put in a better way. Uh, Councillor Chapman now, do you want to respond? Yeah. Um, could we just include, like, keep them the way they are, but add um, to direct staff to investigate, um, you know, one, two, three, and four, so that it, it sort of opens it up for, for um, follow through. Mr. Chapman. Through the chair, we have no concern with adopting two and three as worded. Um, so you can direct staff to start that work. We don't need to investigate it. We'll do that work. And then it's with a view to investigating or, or pursuing the potential uh, closure in November and a, and a permanent closure in number four. So I think it's stronger than what you just suggested. So how uh, could we word it so that the others don't get lost? So I think it's that staff be directed, number two, to form an ad hoc working group. Uh, number three, to work with property owners at 185 King. Um, you know, towards the view of or, um, you know, to explore the potential to ensuring a closure as of November 2019 and making it a permanent year-round access space. But to be fair, all of Council needs the benefit of analysis on this issue before you make a pretty fundamental transportation decision that affects the core of the city. So when would this review be done? Because if we're talking um, an estimated um, opening of, of Gockle Street in November, would we have the information available prior to that date in order to, to um, not be open Gockle? I think what we can commit to is that you would have information to make that decision prior to November. Uh, to the point that was made earlier, it may be to animate it with temporary uses for the time being and not to reopen it, but it may take more time to make the permanent solution uh, and to deal with design issues and that sort of thing. So. Uh, yes, I think we can commit to deal with one and four in, in two phases. A, to allow you to make a decision before November about whether or not you're reopening it. Uh, and it may take longer to achieve the full vision of number four as we work with the community and with property owners to explore it. It's in your hands, Councillor Chapman. I would also add that if you have any changes between now and Council, you have the prerogative to tweak it as well. Um, but just to save you from having to write it all out, essentially, Think for all intents and purposes, when committee is considering this motion, it's essentially approving items two and three, and uh, asking staff to explore items one and four. So, are you suggesting we vote on each one individually? Uh, I think if you want to move it all together, I think that's appropriate, unless someone wants to break it out. To move it all together, though, we're ignoring one and four. You're saying? No, no, you move. move like move the notion that we're going that staff explore one and four and approve two and three. You can move that all as one motion. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. Okay, very good. Uh, Councillor Johnson. Yes, uh, thank you, and uh, thank you, Mr. Nabi. Uh, I think this is awesome. I'm I'm really excited about uh, about this concept, and I think this can be a real show place uh, showpiece. Excuse me, for Kitchener. So that's that's very cool. I was wondering um, with uh, with number three here, though, um, in terms of the um, the transit the transit hub there, or the soon to be old and not used uh, transit hub, that um, we don't have that included here and I think that that needs to be an integral part of number three in terms of um, whatever happens there needs to go along with what what the plans will be will be there and uh, so I would like to see that amended and, and then added. add the region of Waterloo as an additional property owner yes. that, actually that's a good point I think that's appropriate uh, councillor gallery are we just talking about this right now? Or can just I? this right now, yes. Oh, I want to talk to, uh, have questions of staff over the strategic plan. Okay, then we, yeah, we'll come back to that. Uh, Councillor Marsh on this as well? Thank you, Chair Davey. Yeah, I, I uh, wholeheartedly support this, the notion of closing Gockle. Uh, happy to support the motion as it's been reworded. Um, yeah, I think that uh, we should just get rid of the, the, like this is just fine tuning it, but get rid of the term access to their parking lots because I think we just want to um, make sure that they're okay with the plan. I don't know that there is a parking lot at Hartwood Place. 
uh, and at the region, they also, they also don't have access to a parking lot issues there. So anyway, it's just a tiny little detail. It, just before you go, just to simplify, because then that would be a, a further amendment, I would just suggest that if there isn't an issue with it, then it would mean nothing anyway if it's approved. So just instead of tweaking That's it. Fine. Yeah, okay. Okay, uh, yeah. so I also want to um, uh, just m comment that uh, that I I think that uh, closing Gockel can be a first step in uh, looking towards a longer term vision of closing more parts of King Street, which it's been designed to be able to do in the first place. So now that we have uh, less excuses with, um, not excuses, but less reason to keep it open, um, I think that uh, we should turn our minds in, in the coming years towards closing more of King. Very good, thank you. And Councillor Gazzola on this, please. No, I just want to briefly say that I can support where we're going here and, and no more, I don't even have any other amendments to put to it. But I, I just wanted to mention this is something that's been looked at for many, many years. Uh, I can remember back in the 80s they were talking about this, and uh, it, it's a, I, I think it's a tremendous idea. Uh, and it, it's, helped, it's, it's helped me, too, in my thoughts on it, uh, having that the street's been closed off for I don't know how long now, and uh, I... Uh, I often use that street with in a motor vehicle. I use it on my bicycle too, and in a motor vehicle, and uh, found out uh, that it's still easy to get around and having that street closed. So I, I'm totally in favor of uh, the direction we're moving in. I'm I'm confident that staff will uh, look at it and and bring all the uh, all the uh, different uh, opportunities back to us. Very good. Mayor Vibanovich on this. Quickly speaking to the, the, the parking issue, I know where um, Councillor Marsh is, is getting at, and I think if you just get rid of the word lots, um, I mean, should have caught this earlier, but when we added the other two, the issue is that both Charlie West and Hartwood Place don't have lots, but they access their parking from the laneway. That's, that's the issue. So we just get rid of the word lots. It covers all four of them. Okay, noted. Okay, no one else in the queue. Uh, so everything's noted here, but we will now take uh, general questions of staff. If you want to queue in, and I believe Mayor Verbenovich, you were first in the queue before, followed by Councillor Singh and Councillor Michaud. Mayor Verbenovich. This is for questions of staff, correct? Questions of staff. Oh. Yes? Yep, when you're yep. ready. Okay, thank you. Um, and first of all, um, I, I want to begin by, um, in addition to the work that uh, Compass Kitchener has done, I want to thank Karen and, and the team for the work that, that they have done um, around the strategic plan, obviously with um, our senior leadership group, uh, council, and, and, and the broader community. Because this is uh, an, an important document because it, it ultimately guides us as a council and our senior administration as, uh, as we go forward. I do have a, a couple questions, and, and most of them are sort of points around wording or, or, or concepts. Do you want me to raise them now, or do you want me to raise them offline with you, um, Karen? What, what's, what's the preference? Um, if they're substantive changes, we should do, deal with them here, but if there's some minor editing, we could do those offline. Okay, um, so I, I guess I'll just, a couple of ways offline, but there's a couple that maybe are just a little more substantive in nature. Um, and upon further reflection of uh, the message from mayor and council, um, and speaking to the point that was made uh, by Compass Kitchener, uh, I think I, I would like to see us add some more, some stronger wording in that message around creating a more equitable, inclusive community as our population continues to become more um, diverse. And I think we've, you know, it's, it's in there, but it's not in there as, as strongly as, as um, in terms of the kind of tone that I, I think we'd like to see, uh, or certainly that I'd like to see in there. And then the other piece is under the, um, and, and I don't know if this fits more under accountability or under the, uh, the SDGs, um, 
but the notion of, of measurement, and I know you've been doing some work and some dialogue, and, and there's all these sort of measurement tools out there. There's the work that SDSN is doing, there's the work that the University of Waterloo is doing in terms of their city data, there's the community foundation work, and then there's the, um, the global... City partnership. No, 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 the... Uh, city the, 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 the global, the city, the city data, index, yeah. you know who I'm talking about, I just can't think of their name right now. Um, and, and they all sort of have indices that are, are being used and ultimately I guess we're going to use all of them or some of them mm -hmm. to, to measure ourselves in uh, as part of the, the, the reporting. Um, and I'm just wondering if that should be referenced somewhere there or maybe we're not at that point yet where we've made that, that decision. Um. Oh, you were on. You turned yourself off. Oh, sorry. One second here. Okay, go ahead, Scooper. Thank you. Um, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, we are going to do some more work around measurement over the summer uh, with Compass Kitchener, and we, we, we would be reporting back to you on the results of that. What's interesting about Kitchener, it likes to do a made-in-Kitchener approach, taking the best of the pieces that are out there, and so that's what we're crafting. The uh, sustainable development goals were clear people had support for those but there's also some benefit of looking at some of the other measures most of them are very complementary so we're trying to sort of just reconcile all of that right and and and, and, and i recognize that i mean the, the the goals are one piece the the measurements there are all these different um tools out there and, and i think it would be you know I'm, I'm not sure there and i know this is something fcm is looking at as well i'm not sure there's sort of been an agreement on a, on a common front, but it would be great if at some point there would be something like, is it the BL, BLM, B, what, BMA, the BMA um, uh, work that gets done, just so that ultimately, you know, as we sort of start looking at cities across the country and even beyond, we know that we're, when we're comparing, we're comparing apples to apples and oranges to oranges and sort of not comparing apples to bananas or something along, not that there's anything wrong with bananas, but anyway, you know, you know what I mean. Yes. Thank you. Okay, very good. Uh, next uh, is Councillor Singh. Yes, thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. Uh, could we bring up that slide that uh, prioritizes the uh, uh, items over the four years? Thank you, and I think the staff have done a really good job to go through the strategic planning process with council and obviously consulting with the public to get to where we are. Uh, there were some items that were um, um, initially outlined and seemed to be support around the horseshoe, um, speaking one of which was um, housing, well, housing, but specifically um, uh, generational homes. Mm -hmm. Um, is that something that will be addressed through some of the work that's outlined here? And can you reference which one? I know the urban design uh, uh, manual uh, will give a broader sense to the development community of what type of build that the community would like to see, but allowing to lift some of the barriers that we can support that type of housing uh, option for our residents and changing demographic and aspect of affordability doesn't I don't see anything that addresses that. So, so in the um, affordable housing, what we're going to be doing is looking at the projected demand by household type, and certainly the intergenerational family is one type that we're going to be looking at in terms of its um, ability to be accommodated in Kitchener, and right now there's not very many opportunities to do that. So we would identify that as a gap, and then we would identify how to go about filling that gap and reducing and eliminating the barriers and some incentives to put that in place. And, and so that's, that's why I ask about the timing, because we want to make sure that it coincides with some existing work that may be happening. And I know that we will be proceeding with the comprehensive review of our zoning bylaws on the residential side. And this could be some work that could, uh, could be um, kind of lifted up uh, as part of that review. Uh, although it's outlined in 2020, will we make that connection automatically? Um, you'll make a decision on it? Yes. We'll make a connection that the work that's happening through the comprehensive review, yes. the bylaw review, that we will look to uh, capture the suggestions made around the horseshoe about generational home and allowing uh, easier uh, ability to have that type of housing 
the, option. The intent is to do that, and that's why it's a joint initiative with planning and the CEO's office to ensure those connections are made. Okay, good. I'm, I'm glad to hear that because uh, I just wanted to make sure it's addressed. And the other was um, uh, it was outlined for um, uh, for transportation, uh, uh, making sure that we are forward looking uh, in respect to autonomous vehicles. What would that mean to our, our community? I did hear back staff's response in the earliest start session that it's a little bit further ahead. We don't know which direction that industry is heading. But I think we need to ensure that we are starting to review it. Is there anywhere here that, that, would, that work will start, or will that have to be something brought by members of council around the horseshoe, separate from the strap plan? And the problem is sometimes when we do bring these forward, these initiatives, what we get told is, well, we've already, the council has already prioritized the, uh, the bulk of the work for the term of council, and sometimes it's difficult to add on more. And that's why it's important that we, we hear that there is capacity and room with what's being outlined here, or there would be uh, ability to bring that sort of direction at a later time. Okay. Mr. Reedman? Through the chair. Um, so staff will consider changes from autonomous vehicle through the regular body of work. Um, some of uh, the indications from our dialogue with the industry is that it's not going to happen as quickly as this four-year window, so we don't think that there will be mass uptake of autonomous vehicles within this four-year time frame. A lot of the technology is located on the vehicle, so there's likely a little investment from what the city would need to do outside of pickup drop-off and, and those types of things that we would That's monitor over time. That's what I was trying to time. address on, yeah, the pickup yeah. and drop-off zones. So we would monitor that over time. The, the uh, direction from the industry is that it likely isn't going to happen uh, full-scale changeover within this for your window, so, um, but we would still monitor that and um, address things through our zoning bylaw and other things. And if things were to change, we have ability to uh, react accordingly. Through, through the chair, yes. So if there's a significant change to our transportation network, we would, we would look to accommodate that work. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councillor gallagher Sealock. Yeah, I have um, some serious concerns with the fact that the community centres were taken out of um, the strategic plan. Um, if there was, I understand that it's because of the development charges, but if there was, um, we were told that we were going to be made whole, so why are we sh shying away from putting that commitment in the strategic plan? Mr. May would like to answer that. Mr. May. Through you, Mr. Chair, my understanding is that this aligns with the timing of when funding for those recreation facilities is in the D.C. bylaw. And uh, so this lists the, the one facility that will be done by 2022, which is the end of this strategic plan. So the timing of the rec facilities is beyond 2022, which is the life of this plan. Well, then that's changed significantly since we've seen it last. Yes. That timing. I'm seriously concerned about this because... Um, there's community centers that are supposed to be and had timing for the, before the end of 2022, and we don't have them in here, um, at least one that I know of. Uh, and so I'm, I'm concerned that the Williamsburg Community Center isn't um, a part of, of this. Are you looking for a response to that? I'm not seeing a response ready for that just yet. <laughs> Mr. Chapman? So, Mr. Chair, I'm not sure if there are others in the queue or not, but we can go back. We'll pull the, the most recent development charge report that came to Council just to confirm the statement we've made. But um, based on what Mr. May has said, I believe the timing was shown for 2023, but we'll confirm that if there are others in the queue and you can come back to this issue. Okay, thank you. Councillor Gallagher, you like anything further? No. No? Councillor Chapman. Yeah. Um, so, in the, at the beginning of this report, it made reference to... Um, the Waterloo Regional Immigration Partnership and you know the things that they were requesting we include in the in the strategic plan and I don't see anywhere in the plan that ref refers to the immigrant population or refugees or even the Aboriginal community for that matter so I, I realize it would fall under equity diversity and inclusion mm -hmm. strategy but would it be possible to to name um, some of these in the in the plan itself. Mm, okay, I'm not seeing anyone jumping in to answer that question. I guess the only concern would be 
why name some at the risk of exclusion when those terms should capture all of them would be my response. Uh, Mr. May? Through you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, and I would just add that this is uh, a very high-level strategic plan. There are many items within this that don't have the specifics uh, called out, and so I'm not sure why this particular one will be called out. Okay, I guess just because it was brought to my attention and it was also appeared here as um, a group that we did reach out to, and then we sort of ignored that request. Um, okay, um, as I look at this, um, this slide in front of us, do we not already have a bike share program? I mean, is the city planning to, its, to do its own bike share program, independent of the, the current bike share program that's um, out there? Mr. Reben? Through the chair, so uh, right now we're working collaboratively with the other municipalities in the region uh, through this pilot, which this is a pilot program. Um, part of this is to get the data to understand what type of model would work and whether or not we would need to subsidize that. Uh, so indication is that this does form an extension of transportation or transit uh, related type infrastructure. So we would look at uh, the best model and, and report back in the timeline that's outlined here. Okay. Um, um, regarding the pedestrian first street plans to connect Victoria Park and City Hall, um, I see a date here of 2022. Um, we've just had a presentation talking about the Gawkel Street pedestrian, um, what do you call it, Greenway, um, Gawkel Greenway. Um, so what's the connection to what's being presented here on Gawkel Street and what we're showing here in 2022? Mr. Reeman? Through the chair, so there are, if you look at the, um, the wording on uh, page 1-16, there's two locations that are proposed there. Uh, so based on the direction from today, we would uh, prioritize the, the Gockel Street component um, as the pilot uh, work. And then the market, um, we think that it's a little bit more challenging to identify a solution because there are some traffic issues in that area. Uh, so we would push that work out towards the 2022 timeline. So could we maybe separate the two of them out? Through the chair, I believe the direction um, with the motion that was proposed today, if passed as part of this, um, would separate that and provide the direction to staff without needing to revise the strat plan. Okay. Um, that's fine. That's all I have. Thank you. Okay, I'm not seeing anyone else in the queue for questions. I'll take. Oh, okay, Mayor Verbenovich. And then this is more, I guess, when staff get back to us with respect to. Um, Councillor Galloway, Sealock's question. And I, and I think part of the challenge comes when we compare this chart to content, uh, you know, the, the more verbose content uh, earlier in the, uh, um, in the document. But in particular, I'm wondering if on 1-22, um, I mean, we talk about better utilizing existing facilities as the fourth point, um, equitable distribution here on Brigadoon open space. I'm wondering if that whole section or part of that section can be prefaced around language, something around continuing the implementation of the LFMP, including, which would then I think start getting at the issues that um, Councillor Galloway Sealock is is um, is speaking to. Um, and similarly, I, because I, I think where I, where I notice it is, is when you look on, on this chart, it talks about 44 Gockel Street build out. Um, and, but in the broader document, it actually talks about advancing the work on a creative hub. And, and in my mind, it's actually the creative hub that's the bigger and more important piece of work. And 44 Gockel is just a temporary, almost phase one of that bigger piece of work around around the creative hub and so maybe that maybe it's this abbreviated document that's creating some of the challenge okay uh councillor gallery Seelock. um no i just would like to um make an amendment if i can uh yes you can there's one more in the queue but it might be council marsh you comment <coughs> question yeah, if you wouldn't mind holding off just one second, uh, Councillor Galliciak. Uh, sorry, Mr. Lautenbach, do you want to comment? Uh, through the chair, just to follow up on the question regarding the timing of facilities um, that was asked, uh, looking at the DC study, so the Rosenberg Community Centre, which I believe is the one that uh, 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 Kelly was referring to, Seelock was referring to, 
Um, the timing was 2023, so it is outside the window of the strategic plan, but work is likely to proceed in terms of some of the design, in terms of the timing within the DC study, but the actual construction was slated in the DC study as 2023. Okay, thank you. So we'll go to Councillor Galvesi like in a moment, but first question, Councillor Marsh. Yeah, I just, um, I had assumed that the uh, items listed on our uh, accountability chart are all connected to each of the 25 uh, action items, is that? But, I, but I'm seeing that maybe, well, there's tw maybe not. And so I guess what I want to know is uh, when you do, and, and by the way, I love this plan. It's wonderful. And, and kudos to staff uh, and, and all that have been involved. Um, I just am curious, though, when you do your measurement of outcomes, are you just going with this chart, or are you looking at the 25 items, or both? So we're, we're looking at both. This chart is intended to be a short form of what is going to be accomplished, and I've marked down about the Creative Hub to make that clearer in this chart, um, so we can we can make that change. Okay, so the chart is meant to capture all yes. 25 action items. Yes. So but then, when you 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 when we do the uh, measurements, we're going to be looking at each individual action in its entirety. Okay. So regardless of whether it's okay, that's fine. So I won't nit nitpick. I think that you. You'll, it'll be fine. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Galloway. Did you want to bring forward your amendment when you're ready? Um, I would just, even though I heard what Mr. Lautenbach had to say with regards to construction, there will still be work that needs to be completed, and probably in 2021 and 2022, with respect to the Rosenberg Community or our Community Center. Uh, so I would ask that that be added uh, to the um, to the strat plan. Apologies, could you re repeat the amendment portion again? Just want to make sure I get that it. That the Rosenberg Community Center be added to the strategic plan in either 2021 or 2022. Understanding the construction is 2023. Mr. May? Through you, Mr. Chair, my suggestion would be that we can rewrite write this to break it into two sections. Uh, one that references work that will commence in the time of this plan because it's not just the uh, Rosenberg Community Center. I also believe that the expansion of the Mill Cortland Community Center would be in that time. Uh, so I would list those two as work that's being commenced in this time frame, not completed. And so the only one that would be completed would be the Huron Brigadoon Community Center. Yeah, that's fair. Is that satisfactory, Councillor Gallery Seelock? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so that will be your amendment then? Yeah. Okay. Okay, there is no one else in the queue. I will take comments now and then I'll try and track down all the amendments we have going on here. Not seeing anyone in the queue for comment. Councillor Singh. Yeah, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think I've already said that uh, this is a extensive body of work and it's um, a huge undertaking for staff to go through the process, especially a new council, to collectively bring about our ideas and vision for uh, this term of council and put it into this uh, format. And that gives a clear roadmap to our residents and as well as our staff and ourselves of the directions that, that we want to go to and the, uh, the things that we want to achieve. Uh, I think it captures mostly uh, all of uh, the uh, key aspects of things that are of interest to all of us around this horseshoe. Uh, and uh, things that are important by the community. One thing I do want to make a comment, I think this was said over and over again by many members of the council, uh, was that there needs to be uh, capacity and room for new ideas. It can't be that we can capture everything within four years, or, I mean now that needs to be done within four years in thinking um, uh, all needs and requirements of a community. Nothing is so static, things change. Uh, the landscape changes and new needs and, uh, or uh, challenges arise. So there needs to be capacity within a, stra a strategic plan to address those uh, changes. Uh, otherwise, I think what we have before us is, uh, uh, it's, uh, I think, reasonable and uh, attainable and supportive. Okay, thank you. I was coming as well. I know this is a huge body of work, and I, I find it interesting that there's 11 members of council here, and, you know, with all do respect whenever when any one of us looks at it anything more than one eleventh of our own personal preferences we don't really have any reason to think that it is that it should represent more than that and yet when you look at this plan before us I think 
um, a lot of it is in the interests of all of us. Uh, maybe not every single factor, but the, the degree to which it is collaborative and having bounced it off um, the entire community and compass, et cetera, and we're all in alignment is, is certainly uh, encouraging and exciting. So with that, we are going to move into the voting. If I could ask the clerk actually to bring up uh, on the screen again, just so I'm clear. Yeah, there you go, perfect. Uh, this motion, first we're going to, just for clarity, uh, and this is Councillor Marsh brought up first, quick amendment in removing the word lots for parking. Uh, those in favor? And then are opposed, very good. Second amendment, uh, as per Councillor Johnson, adding the region of Waterloo and the former, now former, I guess, or soon to be former, uh, terminal location to be part of the engagement. Those in favor? And under opposed, very good. And I th think that captures it. And we, again, this, just to be clear, we're going to vote in the, this main amendment now, and it is essentially that items one and four that staff uh, investigate, and items two and three uh, be improved. Those in favor? That carries unanimously as well. And now we will take Councillor Galloway Sealock's motion, uh, which is essentially that the community um, facilities commence during the time of this, um, the strap plan. Those in favor? And are opposed to that. And now as moved by Mayor Verbanovich. I didn't miss anything, did I? I don't think so. Yeah. Okay, Mayor Verbanovich. I mean, some of the comments I, I made, um, I presume are going to get like the change in the letter and so on are going to be captured. So yeah, I, I, I didn't actually, move those as amendments. Yeah, so I'm not sure how you want to handle that because there was quite a few and they were a bit of field with all due respect, a little wordsmithing too. So I'm just hoping that you can connect yeah. the staff offline and then fix there, it. In time there's an issue on Monday. We'll yeah, it's been noted for sure. Okay, uh, with that, those in favor and none are opposed. Very good. Thank you for that. Okay, moving along here, the next item, this also came in a separate package, the public access to technology standard. Mr. Murray, when you're ready. Thank you, Chair Deedy. I just want to introduce uh, Sarah Beth Bianchi, who's our Manager of Digital Transformation and Strategy, and she's been working passionately on this uh, project since uh, Justin Watkins moved off, and uh, she'll do the presentation today. Welcome. Thank you for the introduction and for the welcome. Um, now I want to turn this committee's attention to the context that we're in. In this room we have laptops, we have smartphones, and we have a system that's recording and broadcasting these proceedings online. Even the printed pages I'm holding were produced using a laser printer. Digital technology is so pervasive that we might take these technologies for granted. But there are people in our community who do not have easy access to these technologies and their benefits. It is this digital divide that I'm before you to discuss today. In the early 2000s, public access computers and printers were established at City of Kitchener facilities through community-led initiatives and federal funding. The funding diminished over time, but the need for the program has not. City staff continue to support computers and printers in 12 facilities and free public Wi-Fi in 29, forming a public access technology service, or PACS as I'll refer to it. The Digital Kitchener Strategy guides us to implement new ways to deliver service to make our city on demand, connected, and innovative. But we are also taking to heart our need to be inclusive and to guard against making the digital divide worse and to actively seek ways to foster digital inclusion. To this end, we've developed the Public Access to Technology Service Standard to set a baseline expectation for the PATS. We've designed this standard to go beyond just surface details like the number of computers deployed and the speed of the Wi-Fi. There are three principles, applicable, available, and reliable, which are designed to set a baseline expectation for several intersectional aspects of this program. We believe this measurement framework is the first tool of its kind to quantify and monitor digital inclusion efforts. Our goal in bringing this measurement framework to you is not to present you with a perfect mechanism to measure the value and effectiveness of the PATS. Instead, I'm here to present to you our best understanding of how to accomplish that goal, which is based on research and consultation with staff, patrons, the Grand River Accessibility Advisory Committee, and Kitchener Public Library, coupled with a mechanism to ensure continuous improvement of this framework as we learn through its application. 
To that end, the standard includes a schedule to review the measures and criteria, which allows us to take stock and confirm we're measuring the right things over time. With that, I'll provide a brief overview of the framework for this committee's consideration. I'll begin by reviewing the applicable principle, which monitors for relevant accessible technology that serves key use cases for our community. The technology offering measures guides us to make choices to keep pace with technology changes. By maintaining an inventory of our offerings, we create an opportunity to revise that baseline as expectations change, such as adding tablets or webcams to our paths. The accessible measure augments tools like the Ontario Building Code and the AODA by setting some additional baselines, such as minimum screen size and adjustable contrast and font settings that users can access, so that we deliver our technology offerings in a way that meets the needs of the greatest number of people. And we intend to continue developing these criteria in consultation with GRAC. The use cases measure puts into perspective the diverse role that technology plays in our society, whether it be social, civic, educational, and more. And it allows us to watch for emerging use cases that we're not currently serving through this program. The principle of making paths available measures whether we're providing sufficient technology capacity um, at reasonable hours and locations. The hours of access measure allows us to monitor whether facilities hosting our paths provide sufficient periods of access, so hours of the day, and sufficient capacity to serve the needs at peak times, like the after school hours. And the proximity measure monitors the ability for people to reach a facility hosting a PATS um, given various modes of transit. Um, staff can use this measure to determine if there are barriers to accessing this program based on distance from where people live and work. And the re reliable principle monitors the PATS for effective technical support and financial sustainability. And to this end, the technical support measure allows us to keep a close eye on whether we're supporting this technology sufficiently and setting the right expectations for uptime and communication of downtime. PATS is also an investment, and we need to monitor um, that investment through the budget measure to um, ensure it's keeping pace with the value this program delivers. And for this reason, one of the recommendations before this committee is to direct staff to create a dedicated budget item for PATS so that we can improve the transparency of the investment we are making in this program. To recap, the Public Access Technology Service Standard is a measurement framework to monitor this service along three principles, applicable, available, reliable, and includes mechanisms to deliver com continuous improvement. We believe that this measurement framework is a first of its kind and can benefit digital inclusion efforts within the City of Kitchener and beyond. We're recommending that this committee adopt this framework, and further we recommend this committee direct staff to develop a dedicated budget for PATS. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy, for your presentation. Uh, question, Councillor Marsh. Uh, yeah, so uh, thank you very much for that presentation. I'm uh, pleased to see that this is coming forward, and I, I'll be very pleased to support the recommendation. Uh, a couple questions. Is the cost of, uh, if we were to look at adding more units, uh, is the cost of the units um, a barrier at this moment? Typically, the um, cost has been um, funded out of existing budgets, and so we, I do have numbers as to what we've paid in the past. If we were to look at PATS and where we wanted to expand, we could reevaluate what technology we, do, we deploy and, and what costs are involved, so there, those numbers might change. So um, I, cost could be a barrier to entry, but um, sure. I don't have that information at my... That's fine. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I uh, imagine that as, uh, as computers get replaced because they're official lifespan is over, yes. maybe unofficially they're really quite useful for much longer than that, so maybe we could find a way to use those computers. Uh, if not, from within the City of Kitchener, I know at the Working Centre, for example, they have the computer recycling program that we could access uh, refurbished units. Mm -hmm. um, and I just I wanted to ask you also um, about the uh, session management mechanism. Mm -hmm. It's ironic that you're using a, we'll have to use a uh, digital technology to help people sign up for, you know, for the digital access when maybe they won't be able to sign up until they get there. So it'll be a challenge. I'm just, I'm just, isn't it? That's my question. Yeah. <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> so through the chair, um, 
something we've been investigating um, is technology that Kitchener Public Library currently uses. There are ways for people to call the library or to sign up once they've arrived on site. Um, so there are ways to balance that need. The other thing I would call out is while some people may not have a computer at home, they may still have a smartphone or other, other ways to access an online resource for that temporary interaction of signing up. Um, and so by making that portal available online, we're expanding the ways that people can connect and, and make their reservations okay. um, for access to a full-blown computer. Okay, fair enough. So um, my next question is, when uh, if I'm coming and I'm using the computer, I've signed up for half an hour, and then I'm my time is up, but there's nobody else in the queue, uh, can, will it be easy for me to continue using it until there's somebody else who wants to bump me? So at the present time, I should, I should clarify, so through the chair, I should clarify, at the present time, we don't have an automated way of doing session management. So right now, um, when the time elapses, staff will approach um, the person using the computer and ask them to, to move on if there's someone waiting in the queue, or they may choose um, to, to allow that person to extend their time. So right now, it's a personal negotiation. Um, if we introduce an automated mechanism, that would be part of, of the implementation, is discussing with staff at the community centers how best we broker that um, continuance yeah um, this is part of that process change where we would have to negotiate it right now um, the, even the the minimum length of time differs from community center to community center in some cases that's because of the population um, they require a bit more time or uh, the computers are uh, have lots of capacity so they can offer longer periods of time the half an hour mechanism is recommended as the minimum to give a useful sure. period of time while balancing those capacity concerns sounds good i know that in earlier discussions today we heard about community centers where there are lineups of people waiting and so i'm uh, hopeful that we can find ways to increase the number of units uh, in, at, at low cost or no cost to the city mm -hmm. so that we can have a way to uh, provide that service thank you thank you Thank you, Councillor Gazzola. Yeah, I, I must confess I'm not clear on where you're going with, with all of this, but uh, can you just give me an idea? You keep talking about coming up with a big new budget cost center. Uh, what, 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 what are you doing exactly? Uh, uh, how, how does that compare to where we are now? So through the chair, um, what, when I'm referring to the budget, what I'm referring to is actually aligning the spending that's already happening into a dedicated budget item. So we see um, in one place what spending is happening. I'm actually not recommending at this point that we increase that funding, um, but ba basically that we base it on um, existing spending that, that is happening um, and just have it that called out in one place. Does that answer the question? Yeah, that does. But what, what is the existing spending that we're now doing? Uh, so through the chair, uh, we are currently spending money on the on replacing computers when their life cycle is up. I don't have a number um, uh, for spending that's happened. Um, for example, the past year, the last time we replaced the computers was a couple of years ago. Um, and the other spending that's going on is um, related to printing costs. And um, we have just replaced the printer, so um, we are uh, currently monitoring um, how those costs are changing with the replacement of the printer. So again, I don't have a number to, to give you an estimate for what that budget will be. My goal would be to get um, the recommendation from this committee to do that work and, and gather those funds and make recommendations for what that budget item would look would look like. I guess that's what I'm asking for. I'd like to know what those numbers are now, and what do you intend those numbers to be, and what what do those numbers have to be to do what you want to do? I, I don't. You're, you're talking about a principle here, or a philosophy, but you're not really. We have to pay for things, and there's no real indication here of what does it mean. Does it mean that are we going to whatever's being spent now? We're going to have to spend 25 percent more in the future. You know what does it mean? Uh, through the chair, um, my recommendation at this point is that we measure what is happening. So in no in no case am I saying that we have to reach 100 um, percent of any of these uh, measures at this point. My goal is to measure what is happening with the PAPS program. So where what funding is being spent, um, what computer equipment do we have at our facilities, um, and what accessibility mechanisms do we have in place, and use that information to develop in future years um, uh, priorities for where we invest further to augment any gaps that we discover through this measurement. Okay, so in, in other words, you're, you're saying uh, 
you're asking us to allow you to go and, and really look at what we're doing now and, and, and to build upon that and what it would involve. So you really, do you even have to ask us to do that? Uh, through the chair, I'm not sure. I, uh, I, so let me say that uh, yeah. better. Um, what I'm asking for is that this committee adopts um, us making this data or collecting this data, but also um, capturing it and sharing it. I mean, so that we are basically um, demonstrating our commitment to this program by demonstrating that we will measure it and then um, make changes as, as we prioritize uh, through future decisions. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Schneider. Thank you, Chair Davey. Uh, thanks for this. Um, just looking under the um, review portion of the report, uh, I, I like that we've got the re review period set up. They look great. Um, but do we have the ability to react and respond if something significant would change uh, between evaluations? Um, through the chair, I have called out in a few places where um, I'm anticipated potential change might happen that might require um, reevaluation at that time. So, for example, if we were to offer um, significant new technology offerings, such as adding tablets or um, 3D goggles, for all we know, um, to to the program, uh, I believe I've called it out within within. Um, the relevant section that this would trigger us to have to look and make sure that we're measuring the effectiveness of these new offerings. Um, that would be my expectation. If it's not clear in the report, I'm happy to augment it to make it clear that we would want to reevaluate our measures um, with significant change. Okay, no, that, that's fine by me. Uh, just a, a small question here under the terms of use. I know we in the report we're, we're talking all about accessibility, mm -hmm. but in the terms of use, we have a line that says we are under no obligation to help you access or use our Wi-Fi service. I'm wondering if we might need to change that wording just a little bit in that terms of uh, use. Uh, through the chair, yes, I would, uh, I would want to reevaluate these policies. These are the, the existing policies that are in place now, um, potentially for future consideration, um, being able to revise them and have plain language. So maybe access is a word that is too weighted um, with accessibility and, and other, other meanings. Um, but uh, yeah, it's uh, something that would have to go towards a, a review and potentially plain language revision of these uh, uh, policies. Great. And, and maybe uh, just looking down the road, uh, as we talk about uh, accessibility and, and, and uh, things, uh, public Wi-Fi to me is really something that's important. I mean, it's great that we're having things in our libraries and community centers, but uh, there, there are times when people may have a, uh, a phone that uh, they may have limited da data. And uh, for them to be able to access public Wi-Fi where they can uh, access services, even things like our, our parks and our parks and our uh, arenas, uh, the times when, uh, you know, there's tournaments or conventions and people need to connect with each other or maybe even make a, a booking for a reservation for dinner to have the ability to have access to public Wi-Fi. I think it's important to... Uh, uh, kind of push that out in the strategy as well. Uh, through the chair, my my intention with the proximity guideline is to be able to demonstrate that people do or don't have access um, in proximity to where they are or where they, they intend to be. So potentially this could be some data that helps drive that conversation about where we should be deploying additional public Wi-Fi. Correct. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Uh, thank you through you. I, I just want to say how important an initiative this is. Um, we've had uh, we've had talks today on, on other levels about um, our local school boards. Our, I know that our schools and our school boards really count on um, their students being able to access things publicly and uh, the digital divide is so strong in our um, uh, in, in our different in our different communities, and um, this is so important for us to keep on the cutting edge of being an innovative, smart city. So, um, thank you very much for all of your research around this. And uh, as we talked a little bit about before, we know that uh, in our in our community centers, the lineup to use these. Um, um, what we're offering is is big, and uh, that really that really speaks to the need that's out there. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just uh, a couple questions. Myself, very happy to see this before us. So, I understand this is just the first step, but when would we see um, like 
for example, I think we heard earlier today you were you were here, but there was a, a delegate that um, just mentioned that one of our community centers is literally lineups for kids to be able to use mm -hmm. um, the computers that are there. And I think one of the simple th solutions to that is like you mentioned earlier, including tablets in our community centers, which are far less expensive and f have far less of a space requirement. So when would we see something like that actually come? Like, this is the first step in identifying it, but when would we see this idea to grow the program? So, to the chair, um, uh, my expectation is that I would be gathering this data and, and, and sharing it with, for example, people in the community centers um, to help make the case for what needs um, are most need to be served in their community center. So I wouldn't want to make blanket reg reg uh, sorry, recommendations just based on the data. I would want to partner with the community centers. I feel like that work would have to happen um, you know, in consultation as far as setting timelines, in consultation with those community centers as the chief um, delivery mechanism for this program. So um, I'm happy to take that away and, and, um, and come up with a timeline. I, I do want to say that in the work that I do with the city, I always look for um, creative ways for us to test um, ideas and, and test assumptions. So being able to gather even data in one community center that we know is of need and being able to experiment and pilot with things is something that I would be very much in favor for. And I think this data would help drive being able to do smaller scale pilots as well um, to be able to start um, tackling, um, you know, direct needs in, in community centers. Very good. You actually answered my, I think, second and third questions as well there. So uh, the other question I had is it, it's, you listed a lot of, uh, I guess I'm going to say sort of prescriptive details. I think that's good. Um, but one of my concerns in this is, and I think, you know, groups like GRAC are very important to make sure that, you know, some of our units are accessible. But the intention isn't to make every, like tablets, for example, aren't going to be as accessible as um, desktop computers, for example, in many cases. So the intention isn't to make every single device accessible. Correct. So uh, through the chair, I don't expect to, uh, us to have stellar scores in the accessibility um, area to begin with. I'll just establish that. We don't have things like screen readers on our computers. Again, the goal is to gather the data and make the case for prioritizing those, augmenting those things. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, if we are going to add something like tablets, I would be consulting with GRAC to, to look into how do we make those accessible. I have heard um, anecdotally that tablets can be more accessible depending on your area of need. Um, so um, again, there's a huge cross-section of things that, that we're doing to make these things accessible for a larger population. We may be able to serve a need of that subset with other devices. Um, and we'll have to see how that um, comes out as we evaluate those new technologies. Right, or alternatively, um, someone that doesn't have accessibility issues with the tablet might free up a device for someone that, right? So uh, the only other comment I would make when you're going down this road is um, to please look at the most, I guess I would say like the most bang for the buck in terms of the devices that we provide. I did notice, uh, for example, things like color printers in here. I'm not really sure, like, I don't know the exact cost between uh, what the city of Kitchener would buy as a color printer versus a black and white printer, but if a black and white printer means we get an additional three tablets in a facility, then that's the route, obviously, I'd want to go. So just keeping forward with that lens as you go forward, I think, is, is important. Um, but uh, I'm very happy to see this before us. I don't believe I had a mover for this. Did anyone move this? Moved by Councillor Singh. Uh, I already made my comments. Anyone else have any comments before we approve? Thank you for the presentation. Appreciate it. Not seeing any comments. Okay, very good. Those in favor? And that carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I was just going to take a two minute stretch break here. Councilor Marsh on no? Okay. Two minute stretch break, guys, before we deal with the final item.
Okay, very good. Well, Ms. McDonald, when you're ready. Thank you. Uh, to the Chair, members of Council, I'm honoured to be here today to present recommendations to respond to the calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I'd like to note before I begin that I'm presenting this work as a non-Indigenous person and I'm attempting to represent and reconcile the diversity of input that I've heard from the community. I've learned much from the staff in the corporation as well and from some extraordinary people who've shared their knowledge with me. But there is no single Indigenous point of view on this work. There are distinct nations and lived experiences to consider. This business plan item was intended to be delivered in two phases, but the process of scoping the work actually provided answers to inform recommendations. These were not discrete tasks as originally anticipated. This resulted, however, in a much longer time frame to complete the work, and this was also impacted by constraints that Indigenous organizations are facing. Um, they have uh, high workloads, significant community needs, and are under-resourced. As well, there's a lot of work to do to establish trusting relationships, and in some cases, we are still working to establish open and trusting dialogue. Over the past 18 months, staff have consulted with Indigenous representatives of local organizations and post-secondary schools. As well, we've attended talks and events such as powwows and more. There is more work to be done, and this need for further dialogue will be addressed through the recommendations before you today. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action provided the framework to begin this work, but it became apparent that there are other background documents to consider and new information coming out regularly. Since this report was submitted for committee consideration, the final report from the National Inquiry on Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls was released. This includes calls for justice aimed at all levels of government. This document requires further review, but initially appears to have alignment with the work of the TRC, in particular emphasizing the need to restore, reclaim, and revitalize Indigenous cultures and identities. These bodies of work are important, substantial, and specific, but what I've learned from the community is to be careful to avoid treating them as checklists. What we really need is to establish respectful working relationships with Indigenous peoples and to look to them to identify their needs and priorities. We have immediate opportunities in front of us, so while we can continue to look to these documents for guidance, it's more helpful to define reconciliation in less specific terms and move forward. Although we want to avoid that checklist approach, it is still important to consider the calls to action in a specific manner to demonstrate that we're committed to relationship building through action. There are few calls to action that directly apply to us as municipal government, so we reviewed all 94 calls to action. Of the four that are directed at municipal government, two are not applicable. Uh, for instance, there's a call to release residential school records. There were no residential schools in uh, Waterloo Region, and I have checked with records to confirm that we don't have any records to release. Another is only partially applicable. There's a call to adopt uh, the United Nation Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, otherwise known as UN DRIP, um, as a framework for reconciliation, but it's only, it can be honored in principle, but it's unclear how it can be actioned as a framework for reconciliation because it contains many articles that are outside of our jurisdiction as an organization. There are nine calls to action directed at all levels of government. Some of them are not applicable, such as a call to increase the number of Indigenous people working in healthcare. Some can be honored indirectly, such as a call to celebrate Indigenous athletes in history. In the last category, there are eight items directed at other organizations. Please note that your report indicates that there are seven items in this category, but we had a late addition to the report, which made it eight. So these calls to action can be applied by focusing on the intent behind them. For example, there is a call to the federal government to enact a Languages Act. This is clearly out of our jurisdiction, but we can support Indigenous languages in public spaces and in other ways. For example, we have welcome signs in multiple languages in certain community centers, and these signs now include Indigenous greetings. These calls to actions have helped frame our conversation about reconciliation, but this should not be interpreted too narrowly or in isolation of community feedback to establish local priorities. 
Reconciliation is about new relationships with Indigenous peoples. This is an ongoing process of building and strengthening these relationships. It's helpful to consider some of the original treaties that were established through colonization. We often think of treaties in terms of land and territory, um, but they also apply to relationships, such as the covenant chain. So the three links of the chain represent a covenant of friendship, good minds, and the peace. And it's made of silver to symbolize that the relationship will be polished from time to time to keep it from tarnishing. It's important to recognize that nurturing these relationships involves working with many different communities, the different First Nation, Inuit, and Métis who we serve. To demonstrate a commitment to building these relationships, it's recommended that Council adopt a territorial, territorial acknowledgement practice. A community member shared with me this perspective. Keep in mind that an acknowledgement is a polite way of introducing oneself to the territory that they are visiting or moved to. I like to compare it to moving to a new subdivision or a new home. The acknowledgement is a polite way of making introductions to get to know your neighbor. As a corporation, establishing a respectful relationship an acknowledgement presents a starting point in getting to know our neighbors and understanding the land and its history. We know more about the history of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples and their relationship to the land as a result of this work. But we are not asking Council to approve specific wording today because there is more work to do. What is important is recognizing that we need to adopt this practice as an organization and invest in additional training and consultation to proceed with respect. An acknowledgement isn't something that we invented to support reconciliation. It's an activation of an indigenous cultural practice, which requires great care to ensure that it's done right. We are asking Council today to commit to the practice with additional work to take place in the summer months to refine its wording and introduce the territorial acknowledgement at the first Council meeting after the summer recess in August. Through relationship building, staff can pursue additional work to support Indigenous people as identified in the business plan. Very few calls to action apply to municipalities, but we've identified that we can honour the spirit of these other calls through our core services. There are opportunities in the domains of arts and culture, community development, placemaking, sport, heritage and the environment. An important lesson that I learned from the community is not to think of reconciliation strictly in terms of cultural restoration but rather to recognize that Indigenous people can meaningfully contribute to a variety of topics within our mandate as a corporation. The recommendation to pursue new relationships may feel abstract, but our staff are attempting to practice it in these areas in very concrete ways, but struggling. It requires understanding cultural practices like smudging, or having the knowledge to recognize that public space projects can incorporate Indigenous elements. It means understanding the consultation protocols necessary to even begin these conversations, from a customer service perspective, our staff don't know how to respond when asked if an Indigenous group can have a sunrise ceremony or safe space for a vigil. The work to date demonstrated that we lack internal capacity to deliver good customer service, to recognize Indigenization opportunities, and to build these relationships. Of all the calls to action, the most specific, and perhaps the one that has the potential to be the most transformative, is to implement training for public servants, call to action number 57. While there are other calls to action aimed at other levels of government that we can honor, it will be very difficult to pursue this work without a strong foundation of cultural competency. Through appropriate training, we can empower staff across the organization to incorporate Indigenous initiatives into their work and better serve Indigenous peoples in Kitchener. There is also a need to perform additional and ongoing community consultation. Reconciliation is our responsibility as a corporation, but it's also the responsibility of all Canadians as individuals. So I've shared with you a list of um, ideas to inspire all of us to consider reconciliation as a personal action. And the one here that I think is most noteworthy based on what I've heard from the community is listen more, talk less. These conversations can be very difficult and there is still much that we have to learn and that is our opportunity now to listen and learn as a first step. Uh, with that, the following recommendations have been brought forward for your consideration today. Thank you. Thank you very much. There are a number of questions for you, Ms. McDonald, beginning with uh, Councillor Marsh. Thank you, Chair Davey. Thank you, Jeanette, for all your 
uh, very hard and deep. I know it's deep work that uh, you had to go through because it it, it's very challenging. Um, uh, and I want to know um, how has this work changed your perception about what uh, what the city's next steps should be? I mean, do you are are these the recommendations that you you feel are best, or do you think that we could do more? Uh, it, it has been an interesting learning journey, and I did hear different um, feedback from different members of the community that shaped my opinion in different ways throughout that learning journey. Um, so this is a recommendation that I feel sets the foundation for our success for the corporation. Um, the common theme that I heard from the community is that we lack the cultural competency in order to be able to serve them well. And I think that education and training is the foundation for that work. Okay, and uh, can you envision after that initial training program is implemented, uh, can, you, can you imagine um, what would be the logical next steps after that? Uh, the logical next steps would be for staff to start to examine um, more proactive opportunities in their work to consider indigenization. Um, so we have the customer service reactive request that we're getting where we get you know, the phone call saying, I'd like permission to have a sunrise ceremony, but I don't know who to ask or what to do. Um, but there's the proactive work that we can be doing and uh, staff that I've consulted with already have ideas to advance this work. So examining programs and services that we already offer. Um, so looking, for example, at arts and culture, we have a rotunda gallery, and we have an artist in resident program. So staff are looking at the representation um, within those spaces and programs to identify if there's barriers that are preventing Indigenous artists from participating. So those would be the proactive types of initiatives that staff could undertake in order to advance reconciliation. Okay, sounds good. Um, and what about when we have a request uh, that, like for example, uh, I recently had a, a, a group in, in a neighborhood that I represent say, you know, we should name that new park uh, uh, a, an indigenous name. And so <laughs> the question is, well, how do we go about deciding, you know, who to consult on, on what, what to name that in the first place, and then how do we decide in the end what the name should be? And I guess I was just imagining um, that after this, you know, uh, after this work is being done, that perhaps we would have a way to have a, a liaison or a, um, an advisory committee that would help us, help guide us, because the other thing, principle that I know you have um, embraced um, in your work, but that I think we all need to embrace when we go forward with this, is nothing about us without us, right? And so we can't just say, oh yeah, that, that should be such and such a name without it actually being, right? From a person, a first person, First Nations person. Uh, the feedback that I've heard from the community is that they uh, want to be included in those conversations. So when we have a, an opportunity like that, whether it's a naming opportunity or any other type of work, um, Indigenous people should be consulted, um, but recognizing that other people in the community should be consulted too. So a comprehensive community engagement plan should identify all of the stakeholders who are impacted by the work. And so that should take into account Indigenous impacts. And that's where, again, staff might not recognize that the work that they're doing even has an impact on Indigenous communities or an opportunity for Indigenization without the training to understand, uh, for example, the relationship and spiritual connection of Indigenous people to the land. Mm -hmm. Okay. I guess the other thing is, is that um, when we do consult with um, leaders in the community uh, from the Indigenous groups, we, um, we're asking them to put their, their time and energy into a city project and without any room in the budget at this point for uh, compensating them. So can you help us understand how you envision that happening? That is feedback that I've heard from the community. So they uh, don't want to feel like they're being exploited uh, to provide free expertise or work on behalf of the city of Kitchener. Um, and they also don't want to be treated as token participants when we practice engagement. So what uh, was articulated to me uh, that I think made the most sense is that we need to work in partnership 
um, and where it's a two-way relationship. And so we aren't always going to Indigenous people to either check off a, blo- a box or exploit them for their knowledge. Um, and I have heard the perspective as well that they should be paid for the cultural expertise that they bring. Okay, so I have additional questions, but I'll, my time is out. And at the appropriate time, I'd really like to move this recommendation. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Schneider. Thank you, Chair Davey. Thank you, Jeanette, for this. Uh, uh, I do like the fact that uh, we want to implement uh, training programs for staff. I'm wondering, could council be included in that uh, training as well? I don't see why not. Um, It's to everyone's benefit if we all have a a better understanding and can act from a place of knowledge. So I'm I'm not aware of any uh, logistical barrier. Victoria, shaking your head, no. So absolutely. Great. And then and with that, with, with that knowledge now, I would like to uh, make a slight amendment to the uh, third paragraph that uh, we also include uh, and council for the uh, implementation of training programs. So I guess I'll move that out, yep. out of uh, Noted. Yep. Okay. Um, and I, I also uh, really love the fact of the uh, territorial acknowledgement that's coming. Uh, what are the chances of that being um, expanded to uh, uh, events that take place in the rotunda? I think many people see City Hall as the heart of the city, and I think it would be great that from the heart of the city, uh, not just in council, but at all events that we come together to uh, celebrate and, uh, and, and get together, that we also make the acknowledgement there and at events as well, maybe in Victoria Park, where the city is involved. Yeah, thank you for making that point. Um, It is important to consider acknowledgements uh, beyond council meetings um, at important events in important locations. The only real risk is that if we start to do acknowledgements all the time for everything, sometimes they start to lose their impact and meaning. So we want to be careful to make sure that we're delivering them in a meaningful way. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it does not need to be limited to council meetings or chambers, absolutely. Okay, great. So I guess where things are appropriate, it would be great to have that happening. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Singh. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And others have already spoken the, um, the importance of this work. And um, I guess almost a self-realization of uh, how, how uh, in, re- in recognition, of course, um, when in respect to um, a culture of the indigenous people. Um, and much of that will have to do with training uh, of ourselves and our staff. Uh, going forward, um, not to diminish the work that's being proposed, um, but again, it all comes with uh, dollars and cents, and ensuring that we do uh, do that uh, in an effective and efficient way. Um, what efforts have we taken in connecting with our neighboring municipalities uh, and the region of Waterloo, and seeing are they already in the midst of something similar? And if they're not, if we're ahead of them, good for us and take these steps to encourage and see if they want to tie in so that we can be more effective in, uh, and reduce the cost overall to the community. Have we done that yet? Uh, through the chair, um, I have a regional working group that I participate in with representation from Cambridge, Waterloo, the region of Waterloo. And um, it's just at the staff level so that we can share knowledge and experience and help to identify common needs. So training has been identified as one potential opportunity to coordinate our work, um, but that hasn't been advanced beyond this stage yet. Um, In terms of the place that the other municipalities are in, it does vary by municipality. Um, The region is bringing forward some policies like a smudging policy Uh, and does have a territorial acknowledgement, as does Cambridge. So we are working to try to coordinate, and this is an opportunity to potentially uh, create a more efficient delivery of a common need around training. Right. And and I think you said it, you know, when you said uh, when it comes to training and we have to uh, connect with, uh, you know, those that are more versed in in the Indigenous culture, uh, that we don't just seek out their opinion and their knowledge for free, but, you know, uh, they're uh, effectively compensated. So the same thing goes for us if we're a little bit ahead in advance in setting up a, a training program of our staff uh, and better educating our overall community that it's not just, you know, available. For, you know, that's something that's cost-shared with other municipalities. So where do I get that confidence from staff 
uh, that that's something and, and that's an approach that will be taken that before we implement this program on our own we will first present that as an option to the other municipalities in the region saying let's do this together okay I have two members of staff of queue and I'll go to Ms. Rab first and then Mr. Chapman after Thanks through you, uh, Chair Davey. That is part of our plan, uh, Councillor Singh, is to uh, scope out the work of what the training and development program would look like. And once we have a sense of what that cost would be uh, to approach our municipal partners to see if there would be an interest in cost sharing and potentially maximizing that training, <coughs> not just from the cost perspective, but also from the experience perspective, so that citizens in any municipality can start to have the same experience with respect to Indigenous practices um, or their experience with staff. Because it does need to be a wider dialogue. Absolutely. Right. As, as Ms. McDonald acknowledged, we're all at various steps right now so I think it just takes one sometimes to take the first step and have a concrete program of work that they can um, point to and seek feedback on. Okay so there's no certainty as to what that cost will be at this point because we don't know what those steps will entail in cooperation with the other municipalities, correct? Correct. Through you, uh, Chair Davey, we have uh, allotted what we think is an appropriate budget to this work based on similar work um, with the Mayor's Task Force on Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. Um, if, if for whatever reason, as we scope it out, it's more than that, we'll come back to you at that point. And, and so that's, that was where my question was leading in saying that, is that 150 if we do it alone, or is that 150 uh, in anticipation that that's our, would relatively be our share of uh, hopefully uh, cooperating with the other municipalities in the region and developing a joint program? So currently it's if we were to do it alone, uh, we would need to see what the scope would look like if we were looking at a consultant or a trainer that was to do multiple municipalities, but currently we're thinking that's our own cost. So would staff need to be directed that our first step be that it needs to be in conjunction with the municipalities and only if you get a hard no from all of them that we do it alone? That's certainly the direction we could take. Mr. Um, Chapman, Dad. Um, just to add to it, for a number of meetings now, the area CEOs have been talking about this issue in, in the broader context. There's a strong will to do this work jointly. We all share an interest in the issue, and so I'd be very surprised if we go it alone. I also learned recently that the City of Toronto has made a similar commitment to provide cultural competency training to all staff across the Toronto Public Service, which I believe numbers in the tens of thousands. And so although their, their geographic context is different, there are some similarities. And so I think there is potential to look at what, what, mar what much larger organizations like Toronto are doing and benefit from their experience as well. Okay. So I'm, I'm leaving so confidence know that in staff and spirit that our first approach will be to partner. Uh, partner. Yes, absolutely. Perfect. Thank you. Sorry, Mr. Chapman, just for your clue up, um, just a point of clarification then. Uh, the City of Toronto, you said cultural competency. Is this specific to, indi to Indigenous population or yes. is it broad? You no, know, so I, I should have been clear. Indigenous cultural competency okay. training Thank for all you. staff. My time is out. I had another question, but I'll key back in if you want. Please do. Thank you. There's still a bunch of people in the queue. Uh, Mayor Rubenovich. Well, thank you, and <clears throat> thank you very much uh, for all of the, the, the great work that, uh, that you've done on this, Jeanette. Um, it is incredibly important work, and uh, it's great to see both us and uh, our other partners in the region um, starting to move forward on it in, in what I think is a, is a meaningful way. Um, a, a couple things, um, and, and I'm pleased to see the training with respect to uh, staff and council. I think at some point we may also need to think about in a later phase um, some of our, our volunteer groups, um, <clears throat> only because I I think about you know our neighborhood associations and so on that have, as an example, so much interaction firsthand with uh, with citizen groups. Um, I think that's um, anyway that's for that's for a, a later piece of of work going forward. <coughs> On the issue of the, um, the acknowledgement, and I'm certainly uh, pleased to see that here is something to consider at, uh, for something for us to move forward to rather um, on council and um, you know members of, uh, of council and, and staff will note that I mean for some time I've been including it at the beginning of, of things like the state of the city and, and other sort of um, significant city events that that I've been speaking at if it wasn't already done um, because the, the, the practice as I understand and correct me if I'm wrong is it's the host of the event so um, in fact if it's one of our partner groups actually hosting an event here it's really incumbent on them to do it sometimes when they don't I'll jump in but um, that's my understanding the question I have for you has to do um, 
with respect to sort of the standard statement, which sometimes would get used in something like a, a, a council meeting, versus, you know, in, in all of my conversations with uh, First Nation peoples, um, it really should um, it, it really should somehow connect back to the event, and so it's not just the you know I'm here to you know as we begin to acknowledge the uh, the three groups, but actually you know if it's an environmental event connected back to Mother Earth and and so on and so forth to make it more meaningful, um, is 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 it sort of understood that there's an appropriateness to sort of a shorter statement at something like a council meeting and sort of the, the broader one at maybe events and so on where it's more conducive towards that, that more meaningful statement? Through the chair, uh, absolutely. So the intention is to introduce a standardized acknowledgement that can be used at council meetings, but for other events, staff can work with members of council to um, construct a more appropriate and meaningful acknowledgement for that event. Um, feedback from the community is that they, they do really want these acknowledgements to come from the heart and to carry meaning, uh, and then the words of the speaker to uh, be genuine. So if we can work to connect um, ideas related to the theme of the event into the acknowledgement, um, it demonstrates that that thought has been put into uh, choosing words that carry weight. Um, so we absolutely can customize acknowledgements <coughs> outside of this. We're not, in fact, uh, really acknowledgements should evolve over time. So Cambridge introduced an acknowledgement and as they did so indicated that they would be reviewing it after it had been in place for a year. So there's always opportunity to improve, to respond to new feedback or information from the community and change the acknowledgement over time. Okay, and the last question I have is, um, you know, I, I know some of this work sort of will cross over, does cross over, um, in terms of some of the work that we're going to be doing through the Equity, uh, Diversity, and Inclusion Task Force. But it's also, you know, my understanding and, and, and belief that it's important that we, we keep the two bodies of work separate because while there is a, uh, you know, the, a, a crossover in some areas, this is a significant and independent body of work that we need to continue to, to focus on independently, um, much for many reasons, not the least of which is sort of the, 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 the history of, of our handling of it as a country in the past. Is that correct? Through the chair, um, that is correct. So it's important to be looking for those uh, points of intersection between the task force and this work, because there will be some overlap. Uh, the reconciliation is a directive of the federal government and uh, stands on its own as being uh, distinct with respect to um, a number of factors and complexities. Great. So it is typically handled as a, a separate um, body of work in most organizations. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Chapman. Yeah, I just wanted to go back to the idea of an advisory committee, Indigenous advisory committee. So that's not something that you're anticipating in the near future or um, see as something that would be worthwhile, to both to, for educational purposes, but also um, just respect and recognition. Um, I did, through the chair, I did hear um, suggestions around establishing an Indigenous working group or advisory group. Uh, but the sentiment that accompanied it was typically that Indigenous people shouldn't be asked to volunteer their time in order to advance the work. So uh, it's important, again, there's this tension between needing to consult and needing to ensure that Indigenous voices are heard when we make, make decisions, um, but not asking Indigenous people to work for free in order to advance reconciliation in the organization. Okay, and um, when you talk about in, under financial implications, we um, recommended a consultant with expertise in the area. Would that be an Indigenous person or, or just a university professor who teaches on Indigenous issues, right? Uh, through the chair, we would need to identify the requirements for that work. Um, and I'm not sure if nationality can be identified as a requirement. Um, but typically, the people who are uh, operating in this capacity, the consultants who are doing this kind of work, are Indigenous. Yeah, because I think that would be really important. 
Um, finally, um, so when I was on the Safe and Healthy Advisory Committee a few years ago, um, we did reach out to some Indigenous groups and ask them, you know, what, what, what is the work that you're doing and how could the city make your work easier? And one thing that came up, and not just with the Indigenous community, but communities, because I know there's more than one, as you've pointed out, but um, the importance of space. So a lot of these groups don't have meeting spaces, don't have um, a s space that they can call their own. Um, maybe this is something that would come out of the, the work that you're proposing here, but um, I'd like to see it, um, you know, taken seriously and, and see if there are ways that we can provide um, space for Indigenous groups within the, the, um, the community centres or whatever so that they do have meeting places and can advance their own interests. Through the chair, uh, the need for space was identified frequently by the community, um, specifically the need for safe space, mm -hmm. um, where they felt uh, welcome and could fully participate in their cultural practices. Uh, so that's where organizations like the Region of Waterloo have implemented a smudging policy in city facilities so that we aren't navigating those kinds of requests as one-offs. We actually have uh, an appropriate plan and policy to be able to support those practices in our spaces. Okay, good. Finally, one question. Um, wh when you talk about, in this list of um, calls to action, honour through work in culture, honour through work in sport, um, I, what does this mean? It, uh, through the chair, it means that the specific wording of the call to action either applies to another level of government or organization or might apply to something, a, a type of work that we can't actually deliver. But when we look at what the Truth and Reconciliation was trying to achieve through that call to action, we can see alignment to the work that we deliver uh, through our core services. So uh, that would include, for example, um, event support for powwows. That would include uh, work in the area of sport. So we can look at the uh, parade of athletes, for example, in the odd to identify whether or not there's Indigenous athletes who could be represented in that space. And we could look at our sport manual to identify um, how we can encourage um, people who are hosting sport events to incorporate either Indigenous athletes or Indigenous ceremonies into their opening ceremonies for that event. So we're not doing specifically what was asked of us of the call to action, but we're advancing reconciliation thematically through the uh, area of focus that was articulated. Okay. I, I just hope that that would be done very closely with the Indigenous community itself so that it doesn't come down to we are doing this for you sort of thing. So just, okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Uh, yes, thank you. Through you, thank you so much for, uh, for this report. I think it's great. Um, I was going to uh, move the same recommendation that Councillor Schneider did in terms of training for council as well. I think that that's really important. So um, uh, thank, you for, thank you for moving that. Um, along, along those lines, in terms of what other municipalities and, and organizations are doing, I wouldn't just look at municipalities. Um, the public school board, for example, has been doing smudging ceremonies uh, since, I'm going to say, uh, since 2010. Um, they've had a long history working with their equity and inclusion um, department there and working on uh, on various initiatives there. So I think that they that may be a, a group to look at that, they, that they're probably uh, perhaps a little further ahead. Um, as well, definitely our two, uh, definitely our two universities here, uh, we've got uh, professors that are working specifically in that area of study, as well as um, indigenous student groups, uh, et cetera. So I think, that there's, I think that there's probably a lot of things that we can gather from what they're, from their shared experience already that we can be moving here. And I don't mean uh, saying that we would be doing that on a free basis. Um, I, I certainly agree with the point that, that we need to make sure that we're paying people for their cultural expertise, but that there, there is that expertise already in place here in other organizations. Um, 
As well, the, uh, the recommendation around the territorial acknowledgement that we will, uh, that we have been doing here and that we will be continuing and working on, I would like to see a copy of that um, placed in our community centers and our, uh, any of our, our buildings. I think that that would be really important um, thing to, uh, to have as a recognition when people walk into our community centers uh, to see that, um, that that's something that, that not only do we say at that council, but that, that um, we're, uh, we're kind of putting that in motion in our buildings as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Grizzola. You uh, keep referring to what you've heard from the community. Who are the community? That you're the focus of the community engagement was on reaching out to uh, organizations rather than the public at large. So that included working with the um, student groups at the post-secondary schools and professors, as well as local indigenous organizations. Um, but there was some general community engagement that took place at uh, powwows and public talks or events that enabled one-on-one -on -one conversations with people in the commun indigenous communities. What, what is the indigenous population in the city of Kitchener? According to the 2016 census, there were 8,900 people who identified as Indigenous and about 15,000 people who identify as having Indigenous ancestry. The, uh, when we, you're, we're talking here about an acknowledgement. Can you help me to understand exactly what we are acknowledging? Uh, acknowledgement as a practice is intended to identify the people who have a relationship or history to the land. So our proposed acknowledgement would include a reference to the neutral, who were the original inhabitants of the land, as well as the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. So what are we acknowledging? We, we continue to acknowledge them every time we speak. What, what are we... Is that a common practice all over the world? Through the chair, it's an indigenous uh, cultural practice. So acknowledgements can take many forms. They can be as short as two sentences. Um, they can take an hour or more to deliver. It's up to the speaker or the host of the event to determine um, what is important to say in the context of that event. Um, but it is an indigenous cultural practice that I can't speak to its application outside of Canada because I don't know if it's distinct to First, Na First Nations of North America or if it's practiced in other cultures around the world. So we're acknowledging that they were here before we were. That is, is that correct. What we're doing? Uh, the uh, l let me. Uh, I, I really don't totally grasp. I really can understand the reconciliation of what happened and that. We do need to reconcile for that, uh, but you know, you know, I, I don't totally understand everything. But just on this training issue, you you show a figure of one hundred and fifty thousand dollars as the cost of the training. What is that one hundred and fifty thousand for? Is that for a consultant? That's correct. That would be to have a consultant uh, structure a program yeah. for implementation. So there would be staff time on top of that. We were going to train everybody. What, uh, how many hours of training would you expect among our staff? Through the chair, I'm not in a position to comment on that because that would require the expertise of somebody who um, would be developing the training program to mm -hmm. identify what an appropriate rollout would look like for the corporation if there's um, some staff who require more substantial training than others. Um, I'm, I'm not in a position to comment. So the cost, though, will be much greater than $150,000 when you consider the cost of the staff involvement. 
through the chair, there would uh, be staff time that would be required to participate. Thank you. Okay, going to our second time, Councillor Marsh. We have staff training on all kinds of issues. I don't know that we count staff time when we look at a cost of a training program. I'm, it's a comment more than a question. Uh, I, um, I want to know, uh, uh, would, <clears throat> uh, are we ready at this point uh, to consider uh, potentially setting up a, a fund that uh, would allow staff from time to time when, when an issue comes up to be able to pay um, an expert Indigenous leader uh, for their advice on retainer or fee-for-service model, I don't know, but we, we hire photographers in that way. We hire other uh, occasional uh, contract staff, and I'm just wondering, it, it, is it too soon to look at doing that? Through the chair, um, it's not something that I've I've brought forward at this time because uh, it seemed that the training would provide uh, the foundation for all the work that's to come in the future, and I think in the future there might be additional needs then that are identified as we become more familiar with the work that we need to do. Um, it's hard to comment at this point in time on what that could look like. Ms. Rab. Through you, Chair Davey, um, and to Councillor Marsh, I think it would depend on the scope of the project. And so um, there are some projects that are quite significant that we are approached either by the Indigenous community or staff approach that Indigenous community for a relationship. And I think there may be merit on a case-by-case -case basis to look at the depth of, of engagement and consultation that would be required. And if there's an, an expert technical skill set, absolutely we would want to look at um, engaging them in a more professional manner. So would that be something that staff would embark on doing without council direction at this point to hire an expert uh, in uh, from the indigenous community I think we would look at it again on a case-by-case -case basis and if it was a significant cost we would certainly come to council but the one or two items that are coming to the top of my mind um, are ones that I think that we would it would not be a substantial amount of funds and could likely be found in a project budget in in this project budget in a in, a in any old yeah. project budget okay have have we had any precedent in doing that so far? We have not. Paid? A paid oh. paid position? Sorry, maybe other Mr. Mr. Chubb? Uh, through the chair, it's very much followed the approach that Ms. Reb has indicated, that there have been projects in the past where it's been required and the city has, has paid for those services. I don't think budget is the issue right now. I think it really is understanding on the part of staff, knowledge and comfort that um, that when staff move in that direction, they're doing it in a way that's respectful and meaningful. And that's why I would say that uh, the training is the most important thing. The city has lots of budget and where this is, and don't misunderstand my point though, that in a major project where this is a requirement, much like other consultation or planning work, I'm confident we'll find the funding to deal with it. Uh, the greater issue is having staff that are well trained and competent to do it in, in a way that's meaningful and appropriate. Okay, so a follow up then, that's great. So um, if we approve this direction today, is that assuming that staff will, well I guess what, are, what would be the follow up timelines on uh, implementing, hiring and then implementing the training? Through the chair, uh, it's difficult to say because I'm not clear on what the availability is going to be of consultants who are prepared to deliver this work. Um, so the, uh, there are known training exercises such as the Kairos blanket exercise um, that could be deployed immediately. Um, I would prefer to see the consultant um, hired and start to put together that comprehensive training program before rushing to launch training that might not actually deliver high value for staff. Yeah, okay. Well, as you can probably tell, I'm just a little impatient when it comes to uh, implementing this, uh, and so I'll hold off on a potential recommendation uh, to, um, to get more serious about hiring a contract staff at this time. But it's certainly the direction I think that we should go in uh, as we move forward in this uh, endeavor. Thank you, Councillor Singh. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, carrying on with what Councillor Marsh is saying, and to 
ensure that she gets her confidence. I'm sure, I'm sure the direction that uh, the committee and council would be giving does give strong support that we are serious with this body of work, correct? Yeah, so there's no doubt in that. We are proceeding, but uh, sometimes it can take some time, but we want to make sure that we do it in a meaningful and right way, uh, in a sensitive way. Uh, through the chair, um, I'd like to share the seven generations principle. Um, in uh, some Indigenous cultures, when decisions are made, they're made uh, with the understanding that it's going to impact seven generations out. Um, so Indigenous um, timeframes and ways of thinking about time might differ from uh, you know, our perspective on time. So um, the important part, as you said, is to demonstrate a commitment to move forward and um, this, re these recommendations would signal that to the community. Excellent, that's great. And to be honest, I feel sensitive because I, uh, I'm gonna talk about the money again. And uh, I, again, I feel because this is so important, it's almost kind of, you know, you feel like you're disrespecting the importance of this work by talking about the money alone. But I think that's important at the same time. And one question I didn't get a chance to ask is, the federal government is doing extensive work on the, the Truth and Recreation, uh, Reconciliation. Um, in the commission. Um, and they are, I think, associating funding uh, as well with the various works that they're doing. Uh, have we looked at opportunities where we could seek out funding from the federal government uh, uh, to develop our own program? Through the chair, I'm not aware of what different streams of funding are available to support reconciliation. Have you looked, though? That, that was my question. I'm sorry? Have you looked? No, I'm, I'm not. I have not looked. Um, my expectation would be that the consultant who is preparing this program would bring that expertise to the table and would have an understanding of what uh, we could leverage that's already out there in order to deliver this efficiently. So my assumption is, apart from just developing the program, they will look on a larger holistic uh, perspective and see what others are doing. Uh, we've already had that conversation already, but aspect of what funding is available from the federal government also. Through the chair, that's correct. Okay, all right, good. So this could cost us, hopefully, next to nothing if there are funding opportunities, or a lot less than what we have in consideration. We're just earmarking the 150000 potentially what that cost of impact would be to the, to the municipality. That is my hope. Um, I'll just come back for comments, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, just one question myself. Mayor Verbanovich raised, the, the, raised it in terms of um, this needs to be handled or should be handled independently of our general diversity and inclusion approach, the task force, et cetera. What I'm unclear of is why. Like, I, I get the, the history portion and the reconciliation portion, but in terms of the city services portion and the training of staff, earlier we responded to a question saying that we lack the cultural competency in order to serve them well, in this case, indigenous people, but you could say that about any cultural group, I would say, or most cultural groups. So why does it need to be handled separately? That's a, a challenging question to answer because all diversity, equity, and inclusion work is important. So this isn't uh, about giving this a, a different status. It's about recognizing the amount of work that's needed to advance reconciliation um, and distinct aspects of this. So both the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the federal government have characterized um, <coughs> the colonization and death and of indigenous people as genocide, uh, which puts it on a, a different level. Um, there are other aspects of diversity and equity and inclusion work where there's already been more work done. And in this case, we're starting from um, a place where we've done little to nothing to advance the work at this point. There have been some uh, great uh, gestures and initiatives undertaken by staff. Um, but we are really at the beginning of this journey. So there's substantial uh, capacity issues with respect to staff knowledge and experience to be able to advance the work. Okay, I'll consider that answer. Uh, Mayor Rabanovich, are you for comment? And Councillor Saini, is your comment, right? Yeah. Okay, very good. Okay, uh, Councillor Saini, you were first if you want to go ahead. Um, sorry, yeah, thanks, McDonald, just, no, no, sorry, apologies, Ms. McDonald, no further questions, thank you. Just very quickly, I think uh, through some of my com uh, comment, uh, questions, I've already made comments already, so I'll be brief. 
I, I think um, um, we continue to aspire to building a, a caring and compassionate community. And I think that's a wordage that gets used quite a bit. But I think to achieve that endeavor, you also have to acknowledge and reflect on past wrongs and acknowledge past mistakes. And I think that's important because that's the only way that you not only create a caring and compassionate community, but you also uh, help build uh, empathetic future generations. And so I think that's why this work is important uh, for us to educate and train ourselves to be more sympathetic of, um, you know, the where we, you know, the, our community has come from, uh, the lands that we reside on, and give respect to that. Thank you, Mayor Vibinovich. Thank you, and um, I guess just a couple of quick comments. I, I think speaking to, to your particular question, um, I think part of the reason there are different bodies of work, I mean, is this whole, you know, the, the whole reality of, of the, the, the linked to uh, colonialization. But I think the other piece is that, particularly when it comes to our indigenous people, a lot of it is almost unlearning things that, quite frankly, we've been learning for, for generations. Uh, and while you can use that same argument to a certain degree uh, in issues of diversity, it's, it's, it, it has much less uh, history and past. Um, to it that, that quite frankly needs to be unlearned and, and, and hence why the learnings are different um, as, uh, as, as part of the process. Um, but just to overall, I, I am extremely pleased that uh, we're, we're moving forward um, with this. Um, it is um, something that uh, I think is, has been long overdue. Um, you know, I, I think there is uh, much more that we, ca we can be doing um, as a city, and I know, you know, some of the informal conversations I've, I've even had have included things like how do we, um, you know, how can we support things like um, seeing um, the, the, the kinds of things that used to be part of, for example, multicultural festival, um, on the island um, because it was always so close to Indigenous Peoples Day uh, potentially return um, in, in, in the future or, or look at a, a unique you know, special event at, at the city much like we see in some other municipalities. Um, just on that note for, for Council's information uh, there will be a sunrise ceremony at uh, the museum this Friday morning um, prior to 6 a.m. so um, we know Dave will be up, but if anybody else is, uh, is up, um, if uh, anyone's interested, you may w wish to attend. And I know there will be um, uh, celebrations in uh, Waterloo, Squ uh, Town Waterloo Square uh, later in the day, uh, as well as at the University of Waterloo. Uh, so people may want to, uh, to attend those if your schedule, uh, if your schedule permits. But uh, I, I think we're certainly well on the, on the right path. And, and I think this is also, you know, indicating particularly things like training and so on. I mean, there is an element of this that I suspect, you know, not presupposing what the, the work of the um, Equity, Diversion, and Inclusion Task Force is, is going to be. But um, there are elements of this that no doubt will, will need to be looked at. Uh, again, in, in the relation in relationship to some of that work, uh, after that comes back to us in uh, in early 2020. Thank you, Councillor Gazzola. Yeah, when you have the vote on this, I would like you to break the second part out, the, the two parts out, and vote on them separately. Um, I, I know this is a very important subject, and. Uh, we had uh, quite a chat around our supper table last night on this whole issue. I was uh, quite amazed at how much the children, my grandchildren, know about this, how knowledgeable they are about it, because they're learning about it in school. And uh, I, I'm uh, totally supportive of, of where we're going, but I really have a problem with words. Words are so easy to say. I mean, if we really mean something, it has to come. It has to come from the heart. It has to come from our actions. So, I I I don't know what this is uh, going to cost. Uh, we're we're having this training because we're we're the old folks here that 
haven't had it in school and so we're having to catch up on it. You know, if this is the real issue, as we say it is, we have a responsibility to get caught up on that on our own. I don't know, to me it's, it's uh, at this point, because we, we have no idea what it's going to cost to to train our entire staff. So I'm, I'm uh, uh, perhaps I'll change my, my mind down the road. But I'm totally supportive of, of, of where we're going. I'm totally supportive of, of, of doing, uh, of, of changing our ways. Uh, I, I, can, uh, I can really appreciate that. I can appreciate the reconciliation part of it. I know what, I mean, and I've seen this happen to other, to other groups, not just indigenous people of a lot of uh, hardships that they have had over the years that were brought onto them by governments. Some governments have apologized for some things. And here we're, we are, and that's the right thing to do, and here we are apologizing for where we've been. But I, uh, words, words are so too easy to say. Uh, one of the things that uh, we, I heard around the kitchen table was, you know, if you say this all the time, it just come, becomes rote and it loses its meaning. I was pretty amazed to hear that type of reaction coming out. So, so uh, I, I know I'm going to get cursed up and down and sideways at this point in the game, but I will support the first part, but at this time I won't uh, support the second part of it. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Marsh, I'm going to save you to the end because you move the motion if you don't mind. Uh, Councillor Chapman? Yeah, um, just in response to what you're saying, Councillor Gazzola, I had a similar feeling when it came to putting an acknowledgement on my course outlines at the university. And in fact, I didn't do it initially because I thought by putting it there, I'm not really, um, I'm not really knowing what I'm doing. And I don't want to come across as simply um, putting it there because that's what I'm told I should be doing. But then I reached out to, to some people in the indigenous community and they saw that by putting it there, it would at least allow me, in this case, to acknowledge that there is this settler um, world that I come from that um, has impacted, maybe not knowingly in any way, the, the um, hardships that Indigenous First Nations people um, have suffered over the years. So I think there is value to doing it, but I do think... Um, it's also very important to, to not, I mean, there's a sort of a brief acknowledgement here, and that is probably the most bare bones acknowledgement I've ever seen. And I think, you know, what you're, you're proposing is that you'll look at something more meaningful given the, the, the setting. So I think there is virtue of, to doing this, um, and not for our benefit, but for the benefit of, of First Nations, because they're asking us to do this. And even if it's just a reminder of who we are and who they are and um, to help in some way mend and, and create better relationships with the Indigenous um, community. And I think we have to acknowledge that, you know, when we look at um, incarcerations and we look at um, job difficulties in, in getting employment, um, Indigenous people are, are some of the most impacted by the, the current political <coughs> economic model that we live in. So I think... These are all things that by doing these, taking these initial steps, they can help us better understand um, the organization of, of society, I guess. Thank you, Councillor Michaud. Thank you. Um, thank you, Councillor Chapman. I, I agree with everything you just said in your story behind how you learned how to... Um, give more understanding. Councillor Gazzola, I'm enlightened to hear that um, children around your table actually are learning about this. You're right. I'm, I'm part of, well, I'm not quite as part of your generation, but I'm getting up there. And we didn't learn about it either. So I, I feel that um, as community leaders, as elected officials, um, I think it behooves us to learn more about this, um, this, this uh, culture. And so when we do speak just as you said, words just words are just words if they have no meaning. So if we go part of the process and if we do get the staff to learn about this, our words will have meaning. So I will support this. Thank you. 
think I'll just add my comments before we go back to Councillor Marsh. This was actually a bit of a discussion for us as well, and same conclusion as Councillor Gazzola. Like my, my nine-year-old daughter is familiar with um, what happened with residential schools, for example. Uh, so I, I certainly have no problem supporting um, the first portion of this, uh, the, the acknowledgement. I do think that perhaps it might be more meaningful. I should, I should have brought it up earlier, but I'm not going to change anything at this point. But it might be more meaningful if uh, whoever's bringing forward the statement has the freedom to exchange the words as they see fit, because it coming from the heart would be more meaningful. As for the second portion of the motion, I, I, I will, I'll just start by saying I will be supporting it as well, uh, but not after struggling a bit. I mean, my hot take when I read this report was, you know, this money's probably much better off, you know, as a one-time donation to, you know, reservations that don't have clean drinking water or the, you know, missing and murdered Indigenous women. Like, this training our staff seemed like a relatively inconsequential thing compared to, to those measures. Again, that was a hot take and I get it. Um, the second thought I had was why isn't this included in our general diversity and inclusion uh, work that, that needs to be done? And while I still think that perhaps it should be, I don't think it's a hill. I don't think it's a battle worth fighting at this point, so I, I will support it as is. Uh, and I will also be supporting uh, Councillor Schneider's motion, uh, sorry, amendment, um, uh, to ensure that council has equal opportunity to be included uh, in this training. So with that, I will go to the mover, and I know somebody's passionate about this, Councillor Mersh. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Davey. Uh, I agree, of course, with Councillor Schneider's uh, motion, uh, or uh, amendment. I don't even know that we need to vote on it separately. Um, but I, I know that at the time, we should vote on it uh, with a recorded vote. Uh, so I, uh, just a couple of words, just first of all, words matter. Words matter so much. Uh, when I was first elected in 2014, uh, when we were swearing in, uh, I was more worried about trying to uh, articulate the word pecuniary properly than, uh, <laughs> than the fact that we were pledging allegiance to the crown. Uh, and... Uh, but then when I was on a plane to my first uh, Federation of Canadian Municipalities conference, I sat beside a chief from uh, rural Alberta who was flying back to his town after being a part of the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions. Uh, they had a huge gathering of thousands of Indigenous leaders from across the country to receive this, this report. And, uh, you know, and he, he shared his hard copy with me. And... Uh, you can't read a page of that thing without crying. Like, it is heartbreaking what uh, happened to the people who lived here before we settlers came. And just the fact that here we are in this, you know, we are the local government. We are uh, part of the colonization of, um, of this land. Uh, we, we represent um, the, the, the settlers here. And we represent the indigenous community, too, because they are also voters now. Um, but uh, uh, I think that, that we can't just slough it off and say, yeah, well, this should just be enveloped into our equity, diversity, and inclusion uh, task force, which is really just starting now. Um, hasn't quite started yet, but is, is, is in the process. It's, it's separate. It's important that it be separate, in my opinion. Um, I, uh, I, just, I just really think that... Um, uh, Councillor Gazzola's comment, and I'm not going to uh, uh, do whatever you said you were going to do. Uh, I was going to do, but I, I will say that the training is integral to understanding uh, why we have those words, the acknowledgement, in the first place. And so I would implore all of us to uh, to participate in the training, because if we just say a territorial acknowledgement, like we sing the uh, uh, the national anthem every council meeting, then it, it feels a little empty. Uh, but if we do it with uh, gained knowledge from uh, an Indigenous leader who, who will uh, inevitably be the person who gives the training, then uh, it's, it's, it, the deep, it's got a deeper meaning attached to it, and it will help us um, guide us in the next steps moving forward through reconciliation. There's not going to be a fund from the federal government. They are focused on the clean water. Uh, uh, from my understanding, there's still communities in, in Canada that ha don't have clean water, and, and I heard the, 
the uh, Prime Minister commit to 2022 would be when all communities should have clean water. Let's let them have that budget for that very important thing, and I think that we uh, in our city are, the, are fortunate enough to be able to afford some a couple hours of training. So um, with that, um, I'll also just say that in addition to the, the events that uh, the mayor pointed out that are happening on National Indigenous Day, uh, here at the City of Kitchener, we have a very passionate, more passionate than me on this issue, a uh, teacher at uh, Eastwood Collegiate who has uh, ar arranged with, in conjunction with our staff, a uh, National Indigenous Day celebration at the Kitchener Market from 10 a.m. until 3 p.m. this Friday. And uh, so it's free. Uh, there will be in elementary school students participating. High school students will be in exams, but there will be some there as well after their exams. And um, so I just uh, would encourage anybody who has a, the ability to go to check it out. Uh, so with that, um, I, I'll conclude my remarks. Thank you. Thank you. So a recorded vote has been called. We'll first vote on uh, Councillor Schneider's amendment to the second clause that uh, council be included um, in the training. Has everyone voted? Yes. Okay. Oh, oh no problem. Um, voted okay, that that carried unanimously for the record. Uh, and now we will vote on uh, clause number one. which is essentially the first two that's under the recommendation. So everyone's clear. Those in favor? Oh, sorry, Stacy, that's unanimous as well. Very good. And now we'll vote on the uh, second clause, which is the program for staff and council training. Those in favor? And opposed? And that motion carries, and that also concludes.